My guest is Brian Tuff, QGM, a very, very distinguished uh, former member of UK Special Forces, serving back in the seventies, um, old school. Uh, one of the one of the pioneering members back then um, of of yeah of the organisation that was going back then in the seventies, predominantly in Northern Ireland, and. Uh, yeah, God, he got out and did lots of things that we should talk about. He was a commercial pilot. Uh, he was a fireman. Um, he's a member of Mensa. Uh, and he s- established a, a very successful close protection training company, surveillance training company, and an, an operational company as well called Argus Europe. I was actually very surprised he said yes to coming on. A super intelligent individual uh, who very much um, has kept himself to himself since he got out. Uh, but we had... A really interesting conversation, which well and truly went round the houses. Learned quite a few things. So, enjoy the podcast. Brian Tuff, hey Chower. Talking off air, Brian. In fact, Brian Tuff. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> welcome, welcome, welcome. Um, give, give me, uh, not me. Yeah. Give listeners, viewers, a, a a brief background on yourself. We'll probably come on to it more on the podcast anyway. Yeah. But yeah. As a, by way of introduction, uh, if you don't mind. Just quick, lad. John Miltery in uh, 1974. In them days, it was a case of the judge saying to me, "You're going in the army, or you're going to jail." So I decided to go in the army. Probably the best move I ever made. I was in there three year in the Royal Signals. I decided to go for Special Forces Selection, which I did in November of 77. Uh, eventually leaving the military in 85, I was awarded the mention in dispatches in 1980 and the Queen's Gantry Medal in 1985. That's it up to now, when I run a close protection training firm. Argus Europe? Yeah, Argus Europe Limited, yeah. Cool. Definitely come on to that. Obviously, my own experience with it. Yeah. Um, right. You're obviously fucking old school. <laughs> obviously. Obviously. <laughs> So, given given that your background, and uh, I know you have some strong strong uh, strong opinions on on certain things, many different things actually. Yeah, you're really a fucking strong character, mate. Uh, the latest British Army recruitment campaign targeting mm. in inverted commas snowflakes. I don't have a problem with anybody joining the military. Uh, I don't care what colour hair they've got. I don't care if they're gay. What I care about if they really slack standards to get some people through. That will not benefit anybody. It will lower the whole system, the whole ethos of the British Army, which, as I firmly believe, like I would say, is the best in the world, individually, man for man, woman for woman as well. Uh, we've got some great women in the military. I don't agree with from, uh, women being on the front line in the military. They are physiologically different. They can't carry the weight we can carry. They don't have natural aggression in them, I believe, on the most cases, that we do. And I personally think it would affect frontline troops if you have a woman go down to you shot, crying. I don't think that's on. If that's offensive, well, that's the truth. And if mm. people find the truth offensive, that's their problem. There's too much PC ruling everything in this country today. Yeah, I, 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 I agree with a lot of that. Um, I... <clears throat> I think I held the same opinion as you for a while. We regard talk about females on the front line now. Yeah. Um, no, I'll rephrase that. Females mm. in infantry units. Okay? Yeah. Because uh, obviously females have been on the front line for, for a while in different parts of course, groups, medics, of course. And different yeah. parts of groups, and that right. And cutting the mustard. Mm-hmm. Um, infantry is a different kettle of fish. Uh, the only and I've talked about this a few times and thought about it in depth. Talk to different people for lengths of time about it. I thought about myself a few times and. My now my only argument is it, assuming that assuming that uh, females would have to meet the same standards are current physical standards, yeah. fitness standards, strength, and all the rest of it because those are there for a reason. Because you know you, you carry thirty five pounds on your on your tabs or your onboard, whatever you call it, because that's in line with the kind of way you'd carry it the battle and because of the ammunition yeah. scale, blah blah blah. The physical tests are there not because that's what men can achieve. That's of course what needed to achieve, right? So assuming that they have to meet the same targets as men, that's fine. But the one thing you brought up there was the yeah. only thing I can see with, which is the issue is the intrinsic aggression to t- testosterone levels 
it, men have different to women. There's a, you know, the psychology and, and the mental state you have to be in to close it and kill the enemy. Okay. And, yep. and men naturally will flick into that because we are the aggressive sex. Yeah. And that's, we have to be, we're the, we're the people who, you know, we're the guys who flip and get the family alive. And while the, while the, uh, while pe- the people are trying to go against thousands and millions of years, potentially of evolution, we evolved different. I've always had the greatest regard for the MI9 people in the uh, Second World War, the females. Not one of them apparently cracked under torture. MI9? Yeah. Go on. It used to be the SOE, oh, okay. Special yeah, Operator yeah. Executive, where they'd parachute behind the lines and, um, and work there. And uh, beautiful females. You, you've got all the medics. You've got the... Um, I forget the name of the lady that just died from the First World War, a, a nurse who was executed uh, by the Germans. So I've got nothing but regard for the female of the species at all. They can do fantastic, they can do fighter pilots. But when it comes to the physical structure of a man and a woman, we are different. Anybody says different is wrong. We can physically do things. It's quite simple. Who holds the world marathon record? Who holds the world's strongest person record? It's different. Uh, They have many good attributes, and so do we. And we've got to define... What's the best for the British Army in each particular role? Do you think that? Um, I agree. Yeah. Do, you, do, you, do you think that? It, in fact, women are learning on infantry roles, aren't they? they are yeah. Learning, aren't they? Right. So, do you think that uh, through? So again, assuming all they have to meet all the standards that currently have to be met, that men stand, which I think is the case. Do you think that through conditioning, mental conditioning, as blokes go through in the infantry, as any soldier go through, or any anyone any part of the armed services, do you think through conditioning? Um, that uh, females who would maybe lack that ability to switch on the aggression needed to go in and close it and kill. Do you think that through conditioning that can be achieved and, and the impact that you're suggesting would yeah. be they have a, a, of having females in their infantry roles, that the impact can be minimised to a level where it's sort of negligible or not? I personally don't believe so. Um, women are natural carers. Who knows why they have the babies? I don't know that. Um, I'm only a human. <laughs> but um, I do feel that on the front line, if a woman goes down, hit, a man might alter his normal SOPs to go and help her when he might be wanting to get through the firefight and then recover in the situation. I can't imagine, you know, your mate goes down, we don't like it, but you know somebody's come and going back for him. If a female goes down crying... I don't know how I'd react yeah, if not, I was there again. I'm not sure on that one uh, mm. because blokes do that for blokes. Yeah, <laughs> it, it's it's one of it's slack slack drills. I think it's, and yeah. if you're you, you know your your muck is you got a, a best muck of G who's just been shot next to you and the battle's continuing. It's a fucking unless you're in a certain mindset, it's a struggle to step away from and carry on. Right? Anyway, it's, yeah, it's, yeah. Right. Um, there's, I, a, there's I, a million classic yeah. examples of that. It, it, but, I just feel inherently. Um, our need to protect the female is inherent in our genes. And I think that's stronger than a male wanting to help a male in a lot of circumstances, mm. not all circumstances, obviously. Um, you, know, you, you know what it's like <laughs> when you're on the battlefield, you fight for your mates and then your family and the rest follows on after all that. Mm. It's as simple as that in my head. It might not be everybody's opinion, it certainly is mine. Well, I think there's a lot of people's opinion. It's a bit, it's a bit of a I'm, I'm undecided, mate. I'm undecided. Mm. I, I, I'm not sure on, on how big the impacts will be or going to be. I mean, the thing is, as well, it's not just... The impact is not just on that side of things. The, not the potential impact. It's not negative impact. It's not just on that side of battlefield side of things. Yeah. It's, um, it's in the prep. It's the fact that... So in, you know, in barracks around the country at the minute, yeah, it, what, one of the big things about the infantry and between is that masculinity and that cohesion muckers muckers all in the room together all yep. you know, doing socialising you know from being in the showers and you going off at each other to flipping all that male you know yeah I mean I told you right yeah. you, you, you put women in those barracks you have to segregate them because you just do because men and women don't mix that well all the time 24-7 and things don't go fucking pear shape right yeah but then there's that segregation which 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 uh, reduces that cohesion, reduces that camaraderie amongst you because you're not around each other twenty four seven as much as you would, as much as that unit would have been if it was all just men or even all just women, you know. Um, and that then, in my eyes, mm. impacts the capability of a fighting unit as well. 
Yeah, there's, there's a little sort of <laughs> bit of a funny little difference here, but, um, you know, if two of us are out on the ground in an OP, watching whoever, we hold the cling film for each other without going into too many details. <laughs> Would you be in a bush holding the cling film for a female? <laughs> yeah. Them little minor differences might make a lot, but I think the core is I haven't got a problem with a female passing a selection as long as it's not watered down at all in a, any way to get numbers through. Mm-hmm. I've been there when they started putting numbers through. And I'm not a good friend of mine, but a friend of mine got killed on day one on the ground in a terrorist location because they were trying to put numbers through. We can't have it. I would rather work with five men on an operation than ten men, knowing them five men deserved to get through that selection. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, I see what you're saying. I see what you're saying. Um, it's just one of those. It's fucking unknown. It's just an unknown. It, 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 yep. You're not going to know the negative impact until it's fucking happened. And it's got too late, you know, or... I hope this. I I do generally hope mm-hmm. that um we're wrong. Yeah. All right. Uh, and that, <coughs> and that it it actually works in a way that doesn't you know impact mm-hmm. the the capability of the, the British Army because if it works then it doubles the recruitment pool that the infantry have because you can recruit yeah. you know you can still, it's, you've got all the women now. you know so I do hope it works I do, I do hope it works well, you know? um, through the years um, my personal opinion is. They pay too many people off in redundancies and then try to recruit again. And they've always left a void of ill-trained, inexperienced people. Where and I know because we're training a lot of ex-soldiers, soldiers that's leaving, policemen that's leaving, police women that's leaving, female um, military people that's leaving because they're watching the standards go down. Mm-hmm. Unless somebody gets a grip of it, big style, quickly, we're not going to have the same military capability and the same standard of armoured personnel that we've had in the past. Th- throughout your time since the 70s when you joined up, yeah. is, it, is this a, sort of a recurring theme, peaks and troughs of uh, retention problems, recruitment problems, and then you, know, you max out and actually the army's doing well at the standard they want to be at, as in numbers? And down, up and down, up and down? Or is this sort of a crisis that you haven't experienced? To before? me, it's always been up and down, up yeah. and down. Nobody seems to have a sort of balanced grip. You get a new commander, uh, commander land force, for example, uh, running the military who's a friend of somebody that wants to cut defence cuts and is a friend of somebody that's PC-orientated, wrongly, not all the time, but wrongly, and it influences on them. You can see it happening. And I think they should be concentrating a lot more as well. Um, I don't know if this is part of the subject, on veterans, you know, because we just get kicked around here. Uh, I'm not going to go into specifics, but I'm still waiting for details of where I might have to go to court from over 30 years ago. Why can't they stamp that on the head? You want a level playing field? I'm all for that. Um, give people a letter to say, you were a murderer, now you're OK? No, I'm not happy with that at all. Mm. There's not one person from the Omar bombing, slaughtering them kiddies, that is getting done or being searched for. Mm. That is repulsive to me. Yeah, I agree. There's a, there's a, there's a unit I know of, um, a regular unit I know of, and uh, again, we're talking, we're looking back at the 80s now, I think 80s, early 90s, an incident there which a bunch of people got killed including british soldiers and including irish civilians right yeah um and 600 odd have received a letter through the post from uh oh, i won't say it's from it's an official official you know it's an official letter yeah saying um date uh were, were you what were you doing that date we you know were you there and they're trying to get information from flipping 70s 80s you know yeah. it's just it it, it, it ma- it's madness it's, mad, it's, yeah. it's, it's fucking madness, mate. If peace is peace, like I say, clear the living field, let's just get on with it. We're all the same race of people. The Irish, the Northern Irish, the Britons. We're all Britons. We're all a particular strange set of people <coughs> from these bunch of islands. I call the British Isles encompasses all. We're nice people, we're fair people, mm-hmm. but we don't like being pushed around too much. Mm-hmm. And it gets to the point where, and I think, you know, the media doesn't report really what's happening because I think they're scared of what the undertow is happening. And the normal man on the street knows what's happening. We're just about sick of being pushed around. Uh, what, what, what do you mean? What do you mean? Elaborate on that for me. Uh, what I mean is, I'm a veteran. There's veterans living rough on the street. Now, <coughs> I'm all for fair immigration. I don't have a problem. None of us are racists that I served with. We all served with 
coloured guys, for Jane guys, right across the spectrum. A man's a man, a good man's a good man. Simple as that. But why is somebody getting off a boat and getting all these benefits when our kids, our ex-soldiers and all the rest are sleeping rough on the street? It's obscene. And I would suggest if there was a majority vote, we would waltz it with who should get the priority for these facilities. Mm-hmm. Simple as. I, I, yeah, how do you, how do you, I mean, the migrant, the migrant thing is massively news as, as well at the moment. How do you, I, I don't see how you can, I don't see how you can stem. Well, there's two things there, isn't it? Is one is you've got the migrant influx problem. If if it's as bad as the media says it is, if yeah. I I don't that probably isn't, but I, as it's as bad as they say it is, and then you got the size to like you're saying prioritizing, um, the uh, and, and in fact the prioritizing not prior well yeah prioritizing mm. the veterans over above non British folk, you know I think is a fair shout yeah but uh, um, but part of the problem with that is. Uh, in, in implementing that, that sort of prioritisation, is uh, getting all getting all the organisations involved with supporting veterans. No, is sort of all singing off the same song sheet and, and communicating. Uh, I spoke I spoke to a lady called Kate England, who she's uh, the wife of a guy, who, who, uh, ex-military guy who suffers with acute PTSD. Really, I, I met him. It's, it's mm. acute PTSD. I think. I, yeah, I say it. Um, and she, when we were talking about things, she she mentioned what the U, the USA have, and they have. I think it's called the Veterans Association, yeah, which is like an over. Are you aware of it? Yeah, yeah, I okay, am. right. So yeah. I wasn't aware of it. And, and mm-hmm. correct me if I'm wrong. It's an overarching organisation that sort of it it, it um, what's the word? It's essential point of contact and. Control and direction for the myriad of vets, veteran supporting organisations and charities in the USA. Yeah. So they, they yeah organise things. You know, you know, you know, is that correct? Yeah, I mean they look after their veterans a lot more than ours. It's not so long back in, in my time period where you were still thought as a second class citizen when you left the army, and you felt that you weren't sort of worthy of mixing, um, which is a bit funny when I reflect back now, um, because the day I left, I was panicking that I wouldn't fit into Civvy Street. I wasn't good enough. Two days later, I thought, what on earth was I worried about? The standards out here aren't as high as the standards I've just left. Uh, And I used to fly commercially. I used to be a firefighter. I've done across quite a spectrum since I left the military uh, of hard courses, which I like doing, because if you can't test yourself, you don't know how good you're going to be in circumstances. Um, But I do feel there's a genuine need for the truth because people don't like the truth. Sometimes the truth's offensive to people. Well, so what? Sometimes you want to offend people by telling them the truth. It's a simple equation. If people are frightened of the truth, well, where are they going to hide their heads? Because the truth is out there. And uh, like I've said, the media are keeping it suppressed about what the real feeling of this people in this country are. Mm. Um, to do with the military, to do with lots of other things, to do with the NHS. Well, of course, 300,000 people a year coming in from other countries are going to, to have the NHS under a tremendous strain. That's obvious. And, you know, the reality is any migrant that hits, hits the first safe country should be residing there. <laughs> yeah, but, but the, well, I, I think part of the problem with that is, in a minute, is flipping dirty games going on in Europe where I, I can't imagine. So those migrants are coming through. I mean, part of the argument in the news the other day was uh, one of the MPs came out and said, but they're not coming here from a dangerous country. They're coming here from France, yeah. you know. Uh, so it's not they're not they're not coming from a dangerous place. They they should go there. But I can't imagine because it benefits Europe at the moment to to give Britain problems, given the Brexit of thing course. going on. All right, I can't imagine that France are doing a whole lot to stop the migrants getting to Calais. <laughs> None of them are. No. None of them are because I think there's only us, the French, and pretend, I think the Swedes. That give these people benefits, so why are they not going to come here? <laughs> you know, mm-hmm. they're travelling across la- across a continent to get to a boat to cross the English Channel now. And yeah. what we're going to do? Pick them all up and serve them, and that's going to lead to a massive influx. What What's the alternative, though? The alternative is um, we don't let them leave their land, return them back to their land. You know, how many how many Muslim countries are taking them in? Yeah. How many Saudi taken in? No, hey? no just I, yeah, completely, yeah. utterly 
tribal. Yeah. That's what it is. I mean, at the point that they get to our border, yeah, or you pick up in the ocean, or they land on flipping the White Cliffs of Dover, <laughs> or whatever, yeah. right? At that point, what's, what's the alternative to taking them in? Because if we're going to send them back, one, you, it's hard to tell where the bloody hell they come from. Iran, Iraq, Syria, where, you know, wherever. Yeah. Um, and so, so yeah, so that's what I mean. What, what, practically, what's the alternative? I, I, I can't see how it well, can be I, fixed. You know, I, I, I can't, for the life of me, think there isn't a radar system which could detect these boats leaving France. I don't think for a second the French Navy would not be capable of being able to stop them going very far offshore and returning them. Mm. It's like the old saying, once the word gets round, you're not going to come here, pal, then they're not going to come here. Simple as. They mm. don't go to Poland anymore. They're not allowed in. Japan won't let them in. You know, these people look after their own, indi- own indigenous people first, and I don't have a problem looking after my tribe first. We're nice people. A lot of our lives have been put, and a lot of our mates have died protecting these innocent people. We would always protect an innocent person, but it's got to stop from the top. We mm. ain't got the landmass to take a lot more people in. Mm-hmm. Simple. What did Australia do? They turn away, but they put them onto islands, don't they? To, and hold, they have whole processing camps, don't they? Yep. Where they basically just, they just fucking leave them there for a long time. So is Dane, or Denmark as well. That's going to be happening. Oh, they know. do it there, do they? I firmly believe that's just about to be put on, on now. Yeah, put them on an island and segregate them, you know? For processing or...? For processing and then returning. Returning, yeah. Yeah, I suppose, because that's also a deterrent then, isn't it? Because I've heard those, like Australia, I've heard... I, I've heard that's G4S a man in a couple of those islands. I'm, yeah. I may be incorrect. Yeah, I've, I've, heard, I've heard that. Pretty I've heard fucking that. atrocious conditions on it. Because like, they just leave them run themselves. They keep yeah. them in. All the, all the Australian authorities seem to be doing is just keep them, keep them on the island. But what happens on the island is... That's down to you. Well, <laughs> I'm sure one Australian bishop or some rank equivalent has just been on very recently and said, we are not endorsing a 7th century religion in this country. If you don't like it, get out. What's the problem? I've worked in Saudi. When I went to Saudi, I learned some Arabic language. I learned their customs. I was in their country as their guest working. Yes, I'm going to do what they say. It's their place. It's their customs, their traditions. I will adhere to that. I will not set a little Christian ghetto up somewhere in a church. No, I live by their rules. It's their country. Simple formula to me. Okay. Respect the people you're going to live with. The repercussions are blatant if you don't. But yeah. they've also made massive mistakes, having, the, by having them in one great big lumps. You know, the second biggest, the third, Birmingham, Leeds, I believe, and London have three Muslim mayors in. I've got nothing against Muslim. My daughter's got a child by a Muslim, and uh, he's my grandson, and he's a decent chap. But not all of them are. Some of them are here for definite, specific reasons, to create mayhem, create ghettos, and eventually... <laughs> I'll populate us. Yeah, I, I think that's something that's overlooked by um, by the ge- uh, general general civ pop general general civilian in population of the UK. I think is yeah you know, they look at it like uh, I, I'm, I'm like you, mate. I yeah. ain't, I'm not racist. I'm accommodating. I'm the same yeah. as you go abroad. I mean, you I love learning other people's language. I love learning yeah. the culture, and I love living the way they do because. Well, I don't know. I mean, just fucking do, you know. Um, and it's the right thing to do. You know, you, like you say, you're a guest there. You're yeah. a guest there, right? Um, but part of the benefit I've had and you have had in going away and working in some of these places where 99.99999% of the UK have not been and worked is you, mm. and if you've worked there for long enough in whatever capacity, you realise that there's a different in culture which is so, so vast. And when I say culture, we talk about the culture in terms of physically, environmentally, the way they live, but yep. also the culture of their mind. The culture of their mind. And when you bring an Iraqi, for example, yeah. you know, I've worked with a lot of good Iraqis, I've worked with that for a long time, I've got to assure them, but when you bring an Iraqi, for example, into the UK or into any Western uh, Christian-based society, yeah. the culture shock to them is fucking unbelievable, okay? And they, to, to integrate, they it's very difficult for them to do. Individually, it's easier. But like you said, when you mm. get big pockets of whatever culture, whatever denomination, if it's vastly different from Western Christian-based society, 
you have huge, huge problems, especially when it's based on things like, you know, your Sharia law. Yeah. Um, uh, Islam, you know, is, is obviously the blatant one, uh, which, which, which causes the biggest differences. But people don't see that. Yeah, cultural difference. Actually, it's a fucking nightmare. Because by definition, the, the, the people we're talking about, they come from countries which are very, very, very deprived. And with a lot of deprivation comes a lot of crime. My experience, and I'll go back to Iraq again, which is where most of my experience is in terms of day-to-day interacting with the population. Obviously, Afghan was a slightly different kettle of fish to that. But my experience in Iraq and Iraqi people was so generous, so nice to talk to one-on-one. Of course. They'll tell, yeah. anyone, they'll tell you anything yeah. they want to hear. But when you, one of the things is, they, if you ask them a question, they will always answer what they think you want to hear. Whether that's the right answer or not. So, half the time you get lies, half the time you don't. They don't mean to be a fucking liar. That's yeah. the culture, right? They'll try bringing that person over to the UK. Where in the UK, you assume everyone's telling the truth. And they're going to tell you what you want to hear. It's very difficult to understand that. But you get a lot of crime. If you're in a country that gets a lot of crime, very deprived, you become very, very, very short-sighted and you assume everyone else is dishonest, is as dishonest as what you are. So you trust no one and you flip in rob everything. Again, this isn't because these people are bad people. Mm. I'm not saying that. They are good people. But the culture they're in and, they, and, they, and they've grown up in and, they, and of the way they've evolved, in general, if you go, okay, let's compare that country to this country, well, that's a fucking bad country. <coughs> they're not bad people. Just the way they've evolved, like you were saying. Well, it's a part the, the, the temperature, the climate, the temperate climate, you know. This whole country, our country, is self-sufficient in... Lots of things. <coughs> but if you live in a desert, you've got to feed your family. It's the same as the poachers in a way. I dis- have a lot of disdain and disgust for poachers, but if their only option to feed their family is that, we need to do something different. We need to get them to grow things. We need to get them to watch for poachers. We need to feed these people. But it all boils down to the corporates, doesn't it? Mm. The Rothschilds run the world, go against them. And... Uh, You've got no chance. Mm. So it's all about corporate power. They're not bothered about the normal human being, the normal man on the street. They don't care. No, no, yeah. Yeah, no, I, yeah. I, I, have you seen uh, that, the film Zeitgeist? No. Oh, no. Brian Tuff. <laughs> <laughs> it's, uh, it's a film by a couple of guys. Um, I, I remember watching this. I think it was my, the second time I went out on the Afghan tour. The second time I went to Afghan. And with the military, and uh, we were based out of Kandahar. We were doing strike ops out of Kandahar, so we got four or five days trying to go go get HVT, and then we come back in. We have like a day or so in camp. Nice Kandahar, mate. What a I mean, American base, flipping green bean coffee, Burger King, (laughs) 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 mental, right? And then you go out and you be in the Ulu trying to track down some flipping any veggie burgers. Uh, (laughs) No (laughs) veggie burgers, and. uh, I, I bought a TV in camp from somewhere. I, I strung it up inside a tent and I had all the, I had half a platoon, half the snipers in there. And um, someone has like, I put it on. Anyway, long story short, one of the lads gets up, go, mate of mine, goes to go to the uh, shower. He's in his towel. I just put Zeitgeist on. I hadn't mm. seen it before. An hour and a half later, he still stood there in his towel looking at the TV, like mouth agape, and everyone's, he hadn't moved, he hadn't moved, it was just shocking. It's all about, it's like four chapters to it, uh, the first chapter is religion, and, how, yeah. and it, it's about uh, how these two guys are suggesting, they're not saying this is a fact, they're suggesting, uh, if you look at religion in this way, you will see that all the religions that we have, from all of the religions, they all, in, they all come up with the same fucking thing, basically, it's all very, very similar, it's all, they all stem from the same kind of stuff, there's nothing different, it's, bollocks right yeah the, the, se- you know, the second part is about conspiracies 9-11 uh 7-7 uh no yeah 7-7 seven, seven, um and vietnam and how like that's what comes up with you mentioned the rothschilds how these things a lot of them have been engineered into to these conflicts that happen because what they generate generate fucking cash you know they generate cash in one way of shape or form yeah. you know to benefit the corporates, not the people, not the governments. Mate, how the how the fucking hell? This is what. Yeah. Uh, uh, banks control it all, of course. But the Rothschilds uh, I, control the banks. It's, it's madness. It's. Ma- I mean, one of the one of the things is a second like I said. One of the things in there that there's a, there's an economist comes on, and he said, he said, the the world's in debt. 
They said it is impossible. It is impossible to get out of debt. It's impossible because let's take it in, in, as, from a baseline, all right? Let's say money has just started. The only place you can get money is from the bank, yeah? So the government, because they want to issue money to the people, go to the bank and say, we would like a million pounds, please, to issue the people, right? The bank says, yeah, it's fine. You've got to pay it back at, uh, well, I don't know, fucking 10% interest, right? So one million pounds goes into the economy, but in order to pay that back, you need 1.1 million pounds. Yep. How did you get the extra 0.1? Because it's not in the economy. You borrow from the bank. You borrow from the bank at interest. So you borrow your 0.1, that's a 10%. So, you need, it's, it's, in, so it's impossible. So to pay your debt off, you've got to borrow from the people who create the debt. You know, that, and that's yep. baseline what it is. And when you realise that, it's like, fucking hell, what? It's madness. I think when you also realise there's not such a thing as money anywhere. It all comes from the earth. That's just different converted energy. There's enough on this planet. Did you know I worked out the other day? You can get, check these figures out, three times the world population, which is about 22.5 billion, standing shoulder to shoulder in the county of Durham, and you'll have 30% of county Durham left. What? Right. Say that again. (laughs) It's basically 22.5 billion square feet. Convert that into square miles. Right. County Durham's about 260 square mile, where we are at the moment. Yeah. You would have a third of County Durham left, and the rest of the world's population would be in the other two thirds. The whole, if it's the shoulder to shoulder. The whole shoulder to shoulder. And we've decimated this beautiful place we're living on in a very short space of time. Mm. So the money thing, the food thing, it's all there. It all comes from the earth. You sit on the beach, you pick some sand up, it's all come from that. And there's nothing magic going on anywhere. It's just those controlling the control and the corporates, yeah. which I, is sad. How would you, um, if we went and lived in the perfect world and you thought, okay, equal distribution of food and what? I mean, we're in, we're in a UK, we're in a privileged spot in terms of yeah. that kind of thing, food and what, and what we can grow. You know, and if we said hypothetically, okay, let, well, let, we can grow, you know, if we screw the nut, well, we can produce more than what we need as a nation and we should fire some off to countries that can't or need it. You know, that yeah. sort of a distributed sort of wealth kind of thing, but wealth, not just money, and, you know, in, in, in quantities and food. But well, how, yeah. how, how would you do that? I don't know. Well, because of the tribalism that you go back to. It's too late. <laughs> oh, yeah. I'm yeah, a pessimist. Yeah. It's too late. Mm-hmm. We've gone too far. Mm-hmm. I personally think we were put here anyway because we're a, a bacteria. <laughs> we've been kicked off other planets for more than one logic reason I've been reading into. And uh, we've just been kicked out the way because we spoil everything that we go to. Certain things like our bodies aren't really exactly fit for this gravity. Why do we have to squint at the sun when we should have a third eyelid, like every other animal does? There's lots of factors involved. And if you ever have a look at a, a website called Gaia.com, G-A-I-A.com, there's lots of things in, involved here which is beyond our scope. I don't know. I've heard of it. Yeah. I've not, yeah. Right, hang on. So every other animal has got a third eyelid. A mammal. No, no, virtually every other animal can adapt to the sun. If you check the DNA of an octopus or a squid, they're not from this planet. But, but they've been around for, for a lot, lot longer than what we have. We don't know that. I mean, they've just, two days ago, suggested that uh, humans didn't come from the Rift Valley 100,000 years ago. South Africa? Right. Yeah. yeah. They well, found scrolls saying a quarter of a million years ago. So they don't know. They're all guessing. You know? And it's wonderful because we don't know. <laughs> what else leads you to, to think of the to maybe it's a possibility that we came from another another world? Well, you've got the Chinese have dropped something on the dark side of the moon the other day, a yep. little ship. We can never see the dark side of the moon because of a coincidence. The moon always faces us in the same way. The moon is one four hundredth from <clears> the sun. The moon is one four hundredth the size of the sun. So when there's an eclipse, it's perfect. I don't believe in coincidences, I'm afraid. I believe it was put there. We mm. were put there. If anybody thinks this is funny, well, you can think it's funny, but um, we can only think in human capacity. No, no, mate. I, 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 no, no, I don't think it's funny. Mate. It fascinates me. I, the, uh, I'm like, you know, there are possibilities. Mm. But the, the, I, have, I, I have seen, read it, and heard it suggested several times that, um, that uh, octopus 
are not of this earth. And there's and, and uh, again, like what you're saying with with us, with humans, there's there's a, a lot of like valid reasons. When you fucking hell, I, I can't pull up top of my head now. Yeah. But I tell what else I've heard. Uh, I've heard. I heard, I heard it in the block. <laughs> <laughs> the block. Um, I I saw it on a, on a TV program and it was a BBC program called. I think it's called uh, the, the the Incredible Journey of Man or Man's Incredible Journey. Mm. I think it was a BBC three or four partner, and it's all about it's this uh, a female uh, paleo no archaeologist paleontologist whatever who on the series she tracks the birth of man. Ah no, she it goes not Homo sapiens. She goes from Homo erectus, yeah, the birth of Homo erectus in that valley, and then and tracks no Homo erectus and Homo sapiens basically tracks man from. As popping out of the ocean or wherever we came out of, right? And then all the way through and how we distribute ourselves across the world. You know, how do we get to Australia? You know, how do we get to this, that, and the other? She looks at it all. And one of the things that comes out in, two things that comes out in that. One, we genocidal motherfuckers. We wiped out Homer Reckless. We, you know, yeah. they, they pinpointed the last, we're probably the last group of them were in a cave off the coast of, I think it's Croatia. And they were like, yeah. probably the last lot. And we just went in and, you know, just, just topped them. <laughs> Well, and then sh- you, go on. You know, I mean, people can might think this sounds strange, but how does a black person change into a blonde-haired, blue-eyed Scandinavian by evolution? I don't believe it, and vice versa the other way around. Uh, no, if you no. how does that happen? Look, right. If you move to if you move to Africa, it's just melanin. It's just the melanin in the skin. If you move to Africa, right? Move, if you move to Africa and yeah. you had offspring in Africa and your family moved to Africa, mate, in flipping, I would argue that. You know, Probably less than a thousand years time, your descendants gonna be black. Well, because that's not gonna happen anywhere. But <laughs> I don't agree. <laughs> no, no, no. I think we're just we've been put on here. We're different species. It's been physiologically proved. The heart is slightly different. Between what, black and white? Yes. But where's it? Uh, how? Whoa, 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 whoa. Hang on. Well, so, but where's no? no, no yeah. Just bear with me. So, define black. Uh, I would say a normal guy from the middle of Africa. So African descent. Yeah, that's where they say the origin of their species comes from, the Rift Valley in uh, Kenya or Ethiopia. I can't remember which one. I okay. think it was Kenya. And we've all come from that lot. No, we haven't. We've been distributed around the planet for different reasons, different breeds, different tribes, different what have you. Nah. You don't because believe it? No, it's much like a slight diversity, diversification, but um, this evolution thing, I don't believe it at all. You know, you've got a lungfish swimming around in the sea, eh? being happy with itself, plenty to eat, and then it wants to go on land. Oh, I know, I'll take a few gulps of air now and again, I'll grow lungs. I'm sorry, no, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> <laughs> We're all getting conned here. You don't, so what about Darwin? You don't believe in Darwin? I don't believe in Darwin. Fucking no. hell, I was not expecting this line of conversation, Bray. Uh, that surpri- surprises me. That's, uh, really? I, I, mm. That's just a bit like religion isn't like the Ark, you know. Can you tell me why two polar bears and two penguins yeah. <laughs> swam the oceans away from the lovely place we were living together in an Ark to save them from a flood? <laughs> Are we? <laughs> it's the same as the evolution, <laughs> man. <laughs> <laughs> um, the Great Pyramid the, of Giza. The, Study that. <coughs> mm, right, right. So, so there's, going back, the, the the man's incredible journey, or the incredible journey of man, whichever it's called. Yeah, that'd be the other the other thing. So the first the first thing was that uh, yeah, the, the I the two things that interested me, well, loads of it interested me, but that stood out to me was we would <laughs> we as in well, I say we it depends on your interpretation now, doesn't it? Homo sapiens were, were genocidal, right? And the second one was that as a group of it's Pale- paleontology, isn't it? The study of human evolution. fossils. Ah, no, archaeology then. Or oh, archaeologist buildings. Well, the study of humans evolution. What's that? Yeah. Well. All right. So fucking scientists. Sci- 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 I call it human <laughs> evolution. Eh? <laughs> right. So there's a group of scientists, who, um, uh, the most prominent and outspoken one is a Chinese guy, who, because of the differences in the shape of the skull, mm-hmm. believe that the Chinese are a completely different species to everyone else. I believe them. I do. Mm. You know, we've all got our opinions, obviously, and uh, 
one day before long, I hope, I'm going to be sitting on the beach in the cave with my two Irish setters, and I'll see a nice little craft come down <laughs> and start to cleanse <laughs> the place. <laughs> I, uh, well, I was in, listen to this, right? He is a, he is a conspiracy, not conspiracy. This is genuine. I, 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 re- I, rarely, I rarely tell people this, although I did post it on Facebook not long after that. I was in Iraq um, in 2012, pri- doing private security, and I was just off the Iranian border, about 400 metres. There was three oil rigs there, land, obviously land-based oil rigs. And the three oil rigs were in about... They were Chinese oil rigs, funny enough, and they were within about... A couple of cave each other, like in a mm. triangle, almost a loose triangle. Um, and I was inside, I'd done some fitness, I was in, I was in my room, and a, another lad, British lad, came in, a guy called Russ Billington, who was also X3 power. And he said, Hugh, Hugh, get out. It was night time. He yeah. said, Hugh, Hugh, get out here, you've got to see this, you've got to see this. And I think I was doing a report or something. I said, Fucking hell. So go outside, mate. And I look up in the sky, and uh, there's a white, there's a white, um, it's like a spotlight. It, yeah. it, it loosely defined the spotlight, right? Like a white fucking circle in the sky. And it looks like it's shining onto a, a cloud. So like a spotlight under a cloud. My, that was my first thought. That's split second, spotlight under a cloud. But there was no noise. I couldn't hear anything. I couldn't hear a helicopter. It looked relatively low level, although in the nighttime, it's very difficult to tell what altitude yeah. someone did. Right? It looked quite low level. And the shape that was, uh, that was going on the cloud... The cloud had almost linear features, not like a fucking cloud. And it, it wasn't. It didn't look like a cloud. It looked like dust or whatever. And then everything else in the sky was clear, right? So I'm out there watching. Russ out there watching. Everyone, all the Iraqi team are out there watching. The Chinese are out there who have realised are out there. Everyone's up looking at the sky, going, "What the fuck is that?" They are ready. Okay. Turns out all the other rigs are watching as well. So it's not just me who saw yeah. this. Yeah. About 140 people saw this. So everyone's watching this thing, going, "What the fuck?" Then it starts oscillating okay this, you can see it spinning yeah. and it starts it goes almost into the ship of a galaxy so spin off arms right not not a galaxy just i'm yeah. just like internet okay spinning around spinning around spinning around so you imagine it from a from a uh, uh, a, uh, a spotlight it's a spinning arms of a galaxy is coming off spinning 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 and it gets it's getting bigger and bigger and it's static the same point in the sky bright yeah. it's not moving mate there's no noise okay what i thought was a, spot, a, a spotlight shine onto a cloud. It wasn't a cloud, and it's, it was almost like a shape of dust in the air. That was getting bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. Either moving closer <laughs> or actually getting bigger. The second thing is spinning, 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 spinning. Then it gets a slight blue hue, and then it just then just sort of just disappears as it gets bigger and sort of gets thinner and thinner and disappears. Yeah. What the fuck, mate? Well, when I was five year old, I used to go out and watch the stars. There wasn't as much ambient street light about. At eleven year old. 1965, I saw a UFO as clear as clear can be. It wasn't the sun setting because it was in the east. I used to stargaze every night, I still do, and I've seen things up there. And part of the problems I think that we've got at the moment is the normal kids these days do not connect with reality Mm -hmm. and nature. How many kids go out and watch the stars on a night? How many saw the greatest meteor shower last night that has been for years and years? That is part of the problem, that we're not looking outside our own environment at where reality is in the stars. That's where we come from. Mm-hmm. That's where we'll go back to. Tell me about the UFO. That, I've just seen it, hovering, hovering. What, what was it? It was what massive. It, like? it was red. It looked like the normal disc. And I just sat and watched it for about 20 minutes. I went back in to tell me mother, I think I was about, I was 11 year old, and when I came back, it had gone. And it just blew me away. I've yeah. been at the sci-fi and, and the stars since I could walk, basically. That, that, that's what happened with me. I, I, I'm, I, uh, I do think that like most of the UFO sightings, well, most of the reported are all bollocks. People saying, "Yeah, it's awesome." I mean, um, but that's not to say I believe in it. Yes, yeah. extraterrestrials, because balance of probability says there's fucking other things out there, right? It's got to be. Um, You've got to be ignorant not to believe yeah, it. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. But. I do think the probability of seeing them coming here is really low, and seeing one is really low. However, I, when I saw that that night, I literally mm. went about the room. I, like you, I was, I mean, I, mean, I was, what was it, 2012. So I was uh, 31, right? Yeah. 31 year old. I was trying to reason it. I thought, I literally went in my head. I sat at, a, sat at a desk, mate, fucking silent, staring at my laptop in front of me. There was nothing on it. Like, what the fuck? It wasn't a plane. It wasn't a helicopter. It wasn't a fucking spotlight. It, what I thought, well, is it, are they testing some weapon? That, that's <coughs> what I thought. Maybe yeah. t- 
or with the Iranian Iran Iraq border with hardly anyone knows and hardly anyone listens to that fucking media anyway. Perfect place to test some dodgy new weapon. Didn't seem like a weapon. Okay, then what the fuck was it, right? Uh Baffled me. I went on. I went straight online because I connectivity. Went straight online and I I put in the Google uh, UFO sightings tonight. That's what I put in there. Um, oh, UFO sightings over the Middle East tonight. And um, there'd been a sighting two hours before in India uh, of um, a, something racing across the sky. Yeah, uh, probably a fucking probably a satellite or something, right? Racing across the sky. But India's to the east, and this thing that had been spotted was going west to east. Looked nothing like what I'd seen. It was probably, in all intents and purposes, a satellite. Like, fuck, that's not it. So I went looking through then old, basically all the UFO footage on news, right? Mm. And I found something which was exactly the same, exactly the same, Bri, uh, yeah. over Norway, reported on major news outlets, because, and it's on camera. It's over Norway, I think it's 1994. The only difference was it, it's greeny blue and it's a lot bigger than mm. what what we saw, but over exactly the same, mate, in 1994. And that's it. So I was like, that's a fucking UFO. That, does that mean it's from another world? Yep. No, it's a fucking UFO, yep. though. I've yep. never seen anything before, anything since, completely inexplicable, and blew my fucking mind. It's good blew stuff, my though. mind, mate. Because yeah. expansion, yeah. Back, you, you know, it's, uh, anybody studies a great pyramid of Giza, that, w- that was a beacon put there. It probably is still transmitting. <laughs> Well, I, I was actually looking at something like this recently. I don't know why. I think, I think it's because the pyramids fascinate me. I've not really looked into it much. I don't like to talk about things without mm. having done a little bit of research. It doesn't make me mean I know it all, but it means I fucking, I'm not going to talk too much shit. Well, right? it's aligned north, east, south, west, and it couldn't have been aligned to that perfection without the builders knowing it was on a spherical planet. Because it's, aligned, know that it's aligned true north, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. And that, it's the centre yeah. of a landmass. Some people think it represents in the other pyramids the uh, belt of Orion and the sizes to the luminosity in the Nile is the Milky Way. I haven't studied that bit in depth yet, but um, that was one of the books I read of Graham Hancock, who uh, is a superb writer in that sort of uh, field. That's right, because when they were built, but yeah, because when they were built, people didn't know they were, it, was, it was a circle, it was all flat earth stuff. Yeah. And yeah, to get. Yeah, you're right, yeah. True, the yeah, the rumours were yeah. uh, there were slaves, but they weren't. They were artisans, paid very, very well in bread. That's what they were paid. Artisans? Yeah. What's an artisan? A, a skilled rock maker, a skilled okay. tool maker, not a slave. Yeah. He obviously had sort of people that were pulling things and all the rest of it, but they reckon some of them blocks, cranes today couldn't lift them. <laughs> so oh, it's, it's crazy that they can't work out how, they, how they did it. It's There's no hieroglyphics in the Great Pyramid of Giza. And it's built on a factor of 60. Do you know why 60? What do you mean a factor of 60? What do you mean? Measurements, you know, we measure in feet. Yeah. The measure of units of 60. Because 60 is the nearest number that can be divided. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 10, 12, 15, 30. You can't get a number that close where then factors can be divided into it. So that aids to making it square and... Different factors of 60. All sort of... um, all joined together mathematically to, to give it the precision it's got. And it used to be covered in white marble. Uh, and oh, really? just, yeah, I think it's a beacon. I think somebody put us here and put that there to say, yep, I've gotten rid of the virus. <laughs> They're on this planet here. Keep away. <laughs> That's me being a bit uh, <laughs> jovial about it, but half sincere. It's an interesting thing. I've never heard that theory before. Aye, ah, yeah. What about you hold... I uh... know oh, you can't do Actually, that's a stupid question. I was going to mention Scientology, but that mentalist wrote that book, didn't he? What's his name? Hubba. Um, uh, what's his name? Who wrote the Scientology book? I'm not Hubba. sure. Tom Cruise so, was in that type of stuff, wasn't oh, he? Do you know much about it? No, I don't. Oh, if you yeah. want to fucking laugh a minute, yeah. we look at Scientology. So this dude, I can't remember his name. It's some, it's might be Dave. David? Might be something Hubba. Anyway, he, um, he's, he's, he holds the record. He's dead now. He holds the record. He's, he's written the most fiction ever written by anyone ever in the history of <laughs> mankind. He's written, he's written more fiction than anyone else yeah. in the history of mankind, right? And then one day, he, uh, he wrote this other book. I can't remember what it's called, but basically, oh, this is true, and it's Scientology. Uh, it's going to be my religion. And, uh, so everything else is bullshit, but this one is true. And uh, it's the belief that uh, we are an alien life form, and well, we're, we're, we're thousands and thousands of different parts of uh, different life forms that make up our body. Mm-hmm. And we came out of a volcano. We were blown out of a volcano years and, uh, millions of years ago. And uh, 
through Scientology, through your courses, you get to learn the enlightenment and release yourself and go back to the your your, your home your home world. Well, my whole basis of my belief is based on this. <coughs> if people say the Earth was a molten ball of lava, somebody explain to me how you can evolve a thought process from a molten ball of lava. Was that what it was then, at some point? That's what they reckon the Earth was a molten ball of lava that cooled. Right. Water from comets hit, amino acids started to devolve, and then us as humans have evolved from a molten ball of lava. And I say to people, my kids and stuff, can it has a thought process got a mass, kids? They don't think so, Dad. I said, if it's got no mass, it can exist outside the human form, then can't it? And I don't believe we have memories in our heads anyway. I believe we're just aerials receiving and getting data from somewhere I can't think about in my human capacity at the moment. <laughs> <laughs> so, do you... <laughs> That's the greatest podcast ever. Uh, you... So, let me... What was I going to was I going to say then? So, going back to uh, you saying that you think that you can't get a thought process in a uh, ball of lava. I understand where you're coming from yeah. with that. So, you, you think it's just too improbable... That we are you now, purely by um, natural design. Oh, yes. 100%. I 100% agree, believe that. I think it might be just some, some kind of little experiment from somebody or something. But if you... But there's, there's, there's a... I mean, look, there's how many planets in the solar system? 11? 10? Well, well argue, Mercury, arguing at the minute. Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, Sat, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, Neptune... Pluto. They reckon there's another one outside. And maybe Zeon. Yeah. There's yeah, a new one they found. So all those other planets, they haven't got life on them. Well, we're pretty well, sure. We don't know. We're pretty sure they haven't, right? Yeah. So it, it's more probable. But we're talking it, human life, though. That's the difference, okay. you know? Right, okay. We can only see things through our spectrum of our eyes. We can only think through our sense of speed. If somebody can move the speed of light, it might be whipping around us now having a laugh, and we will be looking like static objects. Yeah. But but we but we I mean the the evolution of I see it doesn't seem it, it seems improbable to me okay mm. um, like fucking hell you and me sitting you have a conversation and then you got ants and then yeah. you have got mercury with nothing on it right but then in, yeah. but then if you um how how, to, how can I analogize this if you uh, if you take a, a, a handful of sand yeah right and you got a you got a, a table and that table in the middle is a pinprick hole. A pinprick hole, mate, wide enough to take one grain of sand, mm -hmm. and you throw that. You throw your hand, grain of sand out. Okay, the probability that one of those grains of sand is going to go straight down that hole first time, right? Yeah, is fucking minimal. But for that one grain of sand that goes down that hole, it's going to fucking hell. It's not going to know that any of the grains of sand didn't go down there because it's gone down the hole. Doesn't doesn't know. Goes down the hole and thinks the chances are happening are by natural design. Were it's just so there's no way there's no way someone must have someone must have taken me and right over the top of the hole and dropped me down there, dropped me down mm -hmm. there. But in reality, in the grand scheme of things, <laughs> it, it, it's just it's just the lucky one. Should that be the case with us? I personally don't think so. You know, it's, it's, it's just too improbable to me. It's just like the four forces of the universe, apparently: gravity, magnetism, fusion, and fission. Nobody can explain gravity. They don't know what it is. And when I sit on the beach watching the tide go out and come in and I'm thinking, what, the moon is pulling all that mass of water up and then letting it go. Up and then, why aren't we pulling the moon into the earth? Why isn't it pulling me off? <laughs> why isn't it pulling other things off? But that's explained through phys physics, though. Sure, that's Not all truly, no. But it's only very recently they've discovered what they call the first gravitational wave coming through space. Go on. Gravity can't, ex they can't explain gravity in, in detail as to the sun, the moon, and the planets. They just can't explain it. They can have theories, but it's an unknown force they can't explain. I didn't know that. How can they explain magnetism? <laughs> yeah, but you're yeah. talking low, low, you know, like atom-level physics, mate. Well, my daughter's uh, just getting a first in Masters at the University College of London Physics, and um, she's fairly on board with me, I think. Aren't you she's getting a, what, a master's in physics? Uh, she's getting a first in a master's in physics at the Is UCL, she? yeah. And uh, even she doesn't, you know, nobody knows. that We're just touching, scratching the edge, man. There's always a new theory d 
debunking the previous theory. I just wish people would just open their minds up and think, we can only think in human capacity, we know nothing. Let's just watch the beautiful place we live in. Let's watch the stars. That's where we come from. We're all part of stardust, nothing else. Mm -hmm. And just appreciate how beautiful our little existence is while we've got it. Who knows what's next? Understanding's part of that, though. Sure. Try and understand what you can. Yeah. You know? Yeah. What do you think about... Um, the, um, what do you think about moving to other planets, colonisation? What do you think about that? We're not capable of that. I Yet. don't believe it. Yet. Well, I don't think our bodies are capable of uh, travelling very far anywhere. Unless you're going to cyrogenics or something like that, but... I don't think that's feasible at all. To where? Deep frozen. So, you know. <laughs> oh, sorry, oh, sorry, sorry. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Well, no, we wouldn't, may not have to go very far. You've got Mars. Yeah, but, you know, we'd have to build things there. Colonise them? For what reason? You know? Because we're going to outgrow the planet. There's something not right about this whole situation because 50 years, this June 30th, I believe, when Neil Armstrong walked on the moon, mm -hmm. 50 years and we haven't made progress to go back to the moon on a regular basis. Why? There's not been a need. The only reason China, the only reason China have done it is because they they're trying to. It's for um, dominance. It's for posturing. It's because. Well, why are we sending probes out into anywhere? To 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 learn about what we don't know about. Yeah. Same, same so reason we got just, to the bottom of the ocean. I mean, you've got the moon about two forty thousand miles away. If you're doing ten thousand miles, get there in a day. Mm -hmm. Get there in a day. Sit down, analyze everything, see different perspectives, set a telescope up, which you can see better. Less uh, pollution, like the Hubble. Why aren't they doing it? Because me personally, I think they've been told not to. Keep <sighs> the fuck away. <laughs> <laughs> that, all right, uh, practicality is to put the telescope on the moon. You can't, you can't control the position. The moon can control the position. If you have a, if you have a telescope like the Hubble in space, you can control the position of it in space. If you want to fix on a, a distant object or a constellation or galaxy or fucking whatever. Well, mine can. Because <laughs> I just set it on the geostatic stuff. My telescope, the one I've got, I can set it to follow a star. I'm sure they can. Yeah, as long as stars within the horizon, uh, within the within the viewable sky. Yeah, yeah but well, that's all they would be looking at. But if you have a if you have a if you have a, a telescope in space, as in in an orbit, geostation or not, you can you yeah. can control that telescope. It's not controlled by the, the rotation of the Earth or the Moon. It's, you can keep it pointed on a constellation. It doesn't 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 matter whether that constellation's in yeah. the full view or not. It always will be because the telescope's pointed. I mean, I agree with that. I just think that, you know. A telescope was one example of on the moon. We don't know nothing about it. Why not? Mm. Because, because, I mean, they went to the moon with the equivalent of a half a mobile phone as a computer system to get them there and back. Yeah, crazy. And they're telling me they can't do it better now. No, no, yeah, I agree with you. I just, I don't think there's been a need at all. I just don't think there's been a need. I mean, um, I, pff, we're going to have to, we're going to have to move off the planet. I think we, well, well, having said that, right, having said that, there is a, there is a thought um, amongst like, some brainiacs, some world brainiacs, that uh, regarding artificial intelligence, art, artificial general intelligence, right? Mm. That it, that the progress of artificial general intelligence, moving towards artificial general inte intelligence, which is different to AI. Like, AI is fucking Tesla cars AI, right? But it ain't doesn't think like you and me. Yeah. So uh, AGI is is. Thinking more like human, as in you know, you give it a, you give it a baseline knowledge like um, how like we know when we're a baby, right? How to yep. breathe, you know? Well, how to breathe? That's <laughs> it. That's all we fucking know, right? We know that if we chew our mouth and swallow, you get food and, and drink. That's all we know. Mm -hmm. And then all the rest, you sort of learn yourself as you go on, based on your in your surroundings. That's AGI. You give it a baseline, yeah, and you let it learn itself. You know, uh, so AI and AGI, and they reckon that we're moving that fast towards AGI. Although on some stuff I've listened, uh, listened to recently, and then some others I'm not quite sure. But something that we're moving that, that fast towards it, that AGI will, will, will solve and will, will be able to solve the problem of, for example, climate change and the fact that we're an ever growing population, so be able to create a solution for that problem before it poses a serious threat to the human race. Well, I think that solution will be to exterminate half the human race. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's. I mean, that's a. Or let's say cleanse it instead. Yeah, and that's a. That's a. Yeah, that's a worry. It's like um, the more the work these robots do, the less people have got work. What they're going to be doing, hanging about? Hmm. Well, no, I mean, if you get a, 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 a if you get a you get a ro you know if you get a, a robot that's able to I don't know 
clean flipping dishes, right? And now all those people who are dish, sorry, all those people who are dish dishwashers in the world doesn't mean they're unemployed. What it means is, if you if you if you're able to uh, remove most of those sort of menial, not very um, brain intense, yeah. much brain intensive work, those people are freed up to go and work on more more leisure time more, and stuff. Yeah, yeah, not just more leisure time, but more uh, beneficial. Jobs to to society will create work for them. Will create work for them. I think it's a good thing. I, think I mean, half, half the reason this planet's done is because of, uh, like I was saying before, the corporates. But um, I've just uh, two days ago, the Germans have now produced a hydrogen train. Oh, really? Well, when I was a kid at grammar school, eleven year old, we used to break water down into hydrogen and water vapor. They've had that technology for fifty odd years. It's just the oil hasn't run out yet. Mm. Yeah, so I know, I know BP are working yeah. on a hyd- going back to hydrogen engines for vehicles, looking at hydrogen engines for vehicles. No BP are. It's just them being told when to do it. It's as yeah. simple as that. Once the oil starts running out, now you can do it because mm. we now control them resources. Yeah, we've got the sun, we've got the tides, we've got all the energy we need it comes from natural stuff. Mm. We've no need for any diesel and any petrol. There was no need for that. It's, it's a control thing. It's greed. Yeah. The US has started exporting oil now, they, apparently. What were you saying earlier about um, just getting off the subject of uh, extraterrestrials and uh, fat bear aliens, Brian? Mm. <laughs> what were you saying earlier um, about the $3.5 trillion debt? Yeah, I read something in the Daily Mail. Um, uh, because, the Daily Mail? Yeah, it is, yeah, yeah. <laughs> this is what you read about the aliens? Yeah, well, I was going to get The Guardian, but... Um, <laughs> I've decided to get the Daily Mail instead. It was something like the Germans owed us £3.5 trillion pound debt from the Second World War, which has just been written off for some reason. That was just a little a line I read. I don't read papers mm. in depth. I just scan over them. Mm. Whether it was fake or not, I'm not 100%, because you never know these you days, know, do you? Yeah, I don't know. I mean, that's part of the problem, flipping media. You've got yeah. no idea what's been thrown at you. I, I, it, it breaks me. I mean, uh, it's... It, it, it's like the what's the thirty nine billion that they're on about saving from being being out of the EU. I, I, I mean, uh, we just want I, to, I just get out. Let just get out. I've had my fill of well, all these people. Yeah, I mean, I I, well, I didn't vote. I, I didn't vote uh, because I wasn't sure. I thought, well, I don't know. I don't know enough to to commit myself to an answer. And uh, so I'm not so. Why the fuck should I? Right? And, and I've been well, I've been slated for that. Which you didn't vote. You're you you right. Blah, blah blah blah. Yeah, but I don't know which one. It's and your it's, right to decide if they vote or not. Yeah, exactly. Right. So anyway, it happened. And and I and my opinion is no one knows. No one knows going to happen. I actually think that if we were able to run three parallel universes, Brexit, okay, with a deal. Brexit with no deal and remain, right? Those three parallel yeah. things happening. I think the differences between the three of the outcome for the UK would be so negligible that it, it doesn't really fucking make a difference. I think, no, I don't know. It, so you don't know. It's, it's a con. We, we, we've got unelected people running, them, running, running our countries and we've had it, you know. What do you mean? A commission, you're a commission who elected them. Oh, the European. They appoint yeah, each yeah, other. Yeah, 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 it's, just, yeah. it's just corrupt. Yeah, yeah, it's like the amazing. Soviet Union was many years ago. To, we're Brits, we're Britons. We can stand our feet. We always have done. We always will do. Have you read much up on? I haven't. Just so if you haven't, we won't bother talking about it. But on the this the, this EU army thing that keeps getting battered about every so often. No, you never know how much of that's false yeah. information and stuff, do you either? You know. Mm. But I, I can imagine who'll be the first in if there is EU army. Probably us as usual, mm. taking the flak to start with, mm. and uh, without being too derogatory against other countries for certain other countries. Probably won't get involved, but we'll be part of the EU army anyway. We, oui. yeah, je ne parle pas français. <laughs> <Pardon moi. laughs> Can't speak Italian either, but I'll leave it at that. <laughs> when, uh, when you, when you, when do you get in? Seventy four. Seventy four. Yeah. How can we chose signal? In fact, why did you get in? And I'm gonna. No, my older, in my fact, older no. brother was in before me. Right, okay. Ah, right, okay. So I, is it, I'm going to go back and ask the question. I haven't yeah. asked the question I want to ask. So we spoke about at the start this new um, British Army campaign, right? Yeah. A media campaign. Yeah. Appealing to snowflakes and, you know, like, look, appealing to, in inverted commas, weak people. You know, we see someone who does a shit job at a factory. We see, you know, you see that and you think you're crap. We see perseverance and blah, blah, blah. blah. Right. Now, um, I've been following a bit of the feedback. Most ex-military mates are like, 
it's fucking bollocks, it's embarrassing, blah, 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 blah. I, I actually think it's quite a clever campaign. Mm. And I was thinking about it in the car, yeah. Um, I think about myself. You know, wh- what is the harm of trying to recruit, again, in inverted commas, yeah. the snowflakes of the world today, those kind of people who so many of us, when I say as ex-military especially, think fucking... Growing up, they, they uh, privileged, not privileged. Um, uh, yeah, well, snowflakes. They're flipping, the are whinging everything. What, mm-hmm. like, what is the harm in trying to recruit them into the army? Sure, it's going it's to be, it's going to be better. Yes, I don't have a problem with that. Like I mentioned earlier, at all. I was a snowflake, mate. Uh, reason as I'm long saying, as I was weak as fuck. As long as the standards are kept. Yes, that's the important point yeah. there. You yeah, know? yeah, yeah. I agree. There's yeah. one quick one as well. I thought you'd been a bit derogatory de- earlier on, Hugh. With what? You said you hung a TV up. In your, um, your basha yeah. in, uh, in Iraq. Yeah. Have you got something against transvestites or something? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. I, <laughs> I have not. I enjoy, I, I enjoy my cheese nights at the club. Uh, yeah. <laughs> mm. um, what was I talking about? Oh, yeah, no, I was saying. But before I joined, you know, and bef- before I joined up, I was, a, I was a fucking weak individual. The only thing I had going for me was fitness. That was it. I was yeah. a fit person. And the reason I joined up was really lack of other options. I was, you know, I had really... Uh, same. Where I had class where I was. Really low self-esteem, really low self-confidence. Mm-hmm. It was horrendous. When I think back, I think, fucking hell. And it took me a good while when I was in to get over that. You know, it, it really, it took me up until the first Afghan tour, Yeah, really, to get to, to, to get over that hurdle, as in myself, but within... Um, so it worked for me. I'm, I'm a fucking better person for it. I like to think. I didn't turn out as a shit soldier either. I like to think, you know. Yeah. And I was... Not, you know, it's if I, I do think it's a good. Camp, I think it's. I think it's a good camp. I do think it's a good campaign. It's a flipping recruitment issue, and they're just trying to target a, a demographic that they haven't targeted yet. And in general, I think it'd be good for society. You will improve <coughs> it. If I mean, it, it's like the the national uh, the national uh, what, what's the service no? national service yeah. argument. That would be great for society. It'd be terrible for the British forces. It'd bring the standard yeah. down, yeah. okay, within the British forces, absolutely. But for society, it'd be great. It's as a 50 50, so, you know. Um, it's the same kind of thing. Get, get them in. Get, get the snowflakes in, man them up, or I woman th- them up. I think at least when I've been advising my daughter how to train for the RAF, physical fitness wise, and uh, I, there's a very, very good American general made a speech on YouTube, and he said, start the day by making your bed. And to me, that means everything. Because you make your bed first thing in the morning, it doesn't matter what bad day you've had, when you come back, your bed's made. Now, that's an analogy sort of thing. Yeah. Have you heard of Jordan Peterson? No. Right, mate. Oh, I've got to put you on to him. Jordan Peterson is, is a clinical s- clinical psychologist. Right? Yeah, clinical. Yeah. Yeah, clinical, clinical psychologist. Um, he's a Canadian. He's, he, within the last four years, he's gone from no one knowing him to... He is uber famous, right? For the wrong, for right and wrong reasons. Anyway, he did. He's done a book. Uh, you, could, you could call it loosely a self help book. It's not a self help book. Right? Mm. Depends what you're reading it for, right? It's called Twelve Rules for Life. Each chapter is it's the name of it is, is, is a rule, but it goes into it in depth. It's fucking brilliant, mate. Right? Yeah. And one of them is um, one of the things. One of the headings of the chapters is uh, put your own house in order before you try and fix the world. Yeah. And uh, I. I've 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 had that as a mantra of mine over a few, few periods of time recently where I was like fucking I was just just fucking mentally having a shit time with it. And it's like it, it it's it's that hundred percent like you're saying, make your fucking bed. Because mm-hmm. make your bed, put it in order. Get get it in order. Make your bed, wash your cup after you've had a brew, you know. Um, yeah. put your washing in. don't if you can square yourself away, you you just you're operating at a higher level. All, all, yeah. all, you, you, there's so many different things to it. I mean, it there's there's uh, different forms of discipline, isn't there? I can, when I leave my caravan in the morning where I live, it's cleaned. So when I come back, it's clean when I walk in. There's no way I want to put things to the side. And I've said to all my kids, look, at kids, when you go to bed at night, you put your head on the pillow and you think your own thought. You cannot fool yourself. If you think you can fool yourself, you can't because, <laughs> like I say... If you, if you can think you've done a good day that day and you've been good to people and you haven't tried to fool people and impress them with bullshit, only you can think them thoughts. Only you can analyse how you've been that day and for the future. Mm. Mm. It's about hard work and a bit of effort. 
Yeah. You know, effort reward, big two words I teach my kids. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. There's a, there's a, a, a thought exercise I was doing for a bit when I got, uh, again, as part of this, like, you need to get yourself out, get your fucking head out your ass kind of thing. And it was, um, I can't remember where I got it from. Might have been Jordan Peterson, I can't remember where I got it from. But it's, you get in the bed and the last thing you do in the day, in, yeah. in the night is, or one of the last things you do, which you can't guarantee it's going to be the last thing when you're in your bed, is you go through your day and you say, okay, what's one bad thing that happened today? What's one good thing? And you look at it, and a bad thing could be, uh, oh, I, I didn't do this, or I didn't, you know, I, I didn't put enough effort into work, or a bad thing, and a good thing. And then you, and it, that's it. You just look, you don't analyze it. You go, that's one bad thing, that's one good thing. But it's in your head then. You know, you've done bad, the bad thing, you've done a good thing. It's in your head then for, for the next morning you wake up. Yeah. It's sort of subconsciously, okay, I'm, I'm going to, you, you're trying to better yourself. You want to be good again, whatever. It could be anything. It could be fucking, I made my bed, for example, right? Do you know what yeah, I mean? Yeah, It's um, It's another one that he, he's uh, another rule of J, J, JPs, I call him, is uh, stand up straight with your shoulders back. Yeah. The impact on you mentally as a, as a person, and I, I, there's some kids I know, I'd wish I, I could say this to them and sort of in a way that they would listen and, and, and understand what I'm saying. I've tried a couple of times to, to, to couple, and it doesn't, <laughs> it doesn't work. If you, yeah. there's a difference. You change your posture, okay? You can be the most, have the worst confidence in the world. You're slumped over shoulders, you're moping about. Change your posture. Stick your fucking, stick your shoulders back, puff your mm-hmm. chest out, hold your head up high, okay? Yeah. You're still the same person, but one, people will look at you in a different way and make different assumptions of you, and two, you will flip and feel better, 100%, even just slightly. It, it changes your aspect, just your posture. Yeah, I mean, you know, I mentioned earlier, I go down on the beach, sit in a cave, put a fire on with my dogs, and it's a different world. It's, um, and, uh, there's a quite a good analogy about the electrocardiograph where you've got the ups and downs. If you don't have ups and downs <laughs> on your electrocardiograph and the, on a, uh, create an analogy, if your normal day-to-day ups and downs, you'll be flat. And we know what flat liner means. Mm. You're dead. Yeah. <laughs> you've got to have the ups. You've got to yeah. have the downs. We all get depressed now and again. Sometimes you can't explain why. But if you're sitting with the four elements, earth, wind, fire and water, with peace, and looking at them waves and hearing them waves and looking at the fire and your two best mates, your dogs next to you, I don't know what they're thinking about me, but my two best <laughs> mates, you get sort of a, 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 just a surreal feeling with a little bit of meditative breathing. Mm-hmm. And this guy taught me this, who goes into sub-temperature waters. Breathe twice as over the nose, from through the nose as what's going into your brain, twice as what's going into your lungs, and then two to suck in from your mouth into your lungs. Do four of them slowly, oxygenates you, and it refreshes you, mm-hmm. and invigorates you, mm-hmm. and it's nice. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That's why I still walk proper at 64. <laughs> <laughs> the cardiograph's an interesting one it's like uh, yeah peaks and troughs you've got to have it you've got you to have variation in life it keeps you stimulated like, problems are inevitable it, problems are inevitable yeah but they're all solvable they're all solvable and a, a big a big part of it for me my, my I, I went from being uh, as in mentally I went from being bulletproof yeah you know complete positive positive all the time Every, any situation you saw whether it was an issue you know a problematic situation I see the positive out of it and, and yeah. where it could go. It just, I naturally did that. I was very lucky. And then uh, over the year, like separation and the house selling at the same time, fucking epic. And then it went not like that. And I sort of a mix. Um, but one of the, my, so to try and get myself into that more positive frame of mind, mm-hmm. one of the things I sort of had to make myself realize again is that uh, the, you know, <coughs> there is no, Every day, happy day, every hour, every second, of happy. Not. It does not exist. No. There's always going to be a problem. And when you accept that, there's always going to be problems throughout your life till the end. It's always going to be hardships. It's always going to be people fucking dying. You know, your, your family, your friends going, and once you accept that kind of stuff, that is the case, hmm. okay, then it becomes just a, you're on a journey. Leapfrog the obstacles, get round the obstacles, and just crack on. Because yeah. there's gaps in between, well, it's, it's good crack. You know, and, of course. It's, uh, I'm going to go through a, a, the, probably the worst selection in my life when I finish work because I won't know what to do. <laughs> what from, are you going to do? Apart from one of the highlands with the dogs. But, but you know, it's, it's an unknown factor. Uh, 
that's going to be happening to me because I've been full steam ahead since I was three year old since I can remember. Is it a? But you've got yeah, you've got an interesting brain as well, though. I'll, I'll, I'll find something. I'll find something because um, obviously with a partially sighted bit as well, I can't see the stars as well as I used to. <coughs> so I've been buying some equipment to cater for that. But uh, I'll be the wildlife spaceship. Got a spaceship? Yeah, I just I can move myself around without <laughs> uh, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Is it true, right, that you remember a Mensa or were? Yeah, I was. Yeah, yeah. Uh, come on. Go. I joined in 1986. I used to help the Mensa school. I'd given a, an official IQ of 161. Fucking hell. And uh, I used to help at their summer schools. Uh, these beautiful kids, um, bright kids, obviously. Um, some of them felt very isolated. I went to uh, Kilroy Silk, if you remember that programme, twice. Yeah. And uh, Oh, I remember Kilroy Silk. Yeah. You went on Kilroy Silk twice. Yeah, for the Mensa Foundation for Gifted Children, which I used to run in North Yorkshire. And... Uh, it was good to get these kids because some of these kids felt isolated in the classroom. And uh, were they normal schools? Normal schools, right. yeah. But they were putting far more, a lot more resources into people that near that had special needs. And I regarded as these bright kids had special needs as well. Because this country isn't going to get any better by everybody being average. Mm. It's a simple case of that. It's being better by utilising the kids that's got a brain and putting them on the right path to the way they want to go. Um, I moved away from North Yorkshire, that's why I, I had to stop doing it. But it was, it was quite a fascinating time in my life. Was that after you got out then? Yeah, yeah, I was, I was doing RST, um, and I started by doing the Daily Telegraph Mensa quiz for three weeks, sent it in and uh, got invited to a, an official um, Mensa test at Teesside University. Oh, oh well, that into, how long was that for? How long did that take? It was about two hours, I think. But the tests are designed called the Cattrall test, I think they were called. So even a child like in the middle of the Amazon jungle that can't speak English yeah. would be able to analyse his IQ purely by certain mathematical equations and, and <gasps> the brain going different sort of ways. So I've always wondered this with yeah. the IQ side of things. Is that is that um, surely to have a high IQ, you have to have had some level of sort of first world education? But this no. No, okay. a lot of it they reckon it's just natural. Uh, it's got its disadvantages because I've got, unfortunately, or fortunately in some cases, exceptional memory retention. Uh, and that sometimes doesn't play well when you remember bad things back because <laughs> mm. you remember them in finer detail than most people. So does you, well, I think the normal, the normal, normal brains, um, not normal, but across the board average, I think, is, is the, the brain's ability to eliminate the 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 painful elements of an experience or or whole experience you know when you when you go and so someone remembers back the london marathon who did it this year yeah. and next you remember it, like they asked like fucking hell it's hideous never doing that again next year they remember it back they don't remember you, you don't you can't remember pain yeah. as in you can't remember the feeling you can't mm. remember elation you can't remember happiness you know is that the kind of thing you you, you mean yeah it's um you, you know i'll keep mentioning again that bit of meditation down in the cave not i don't sit there on one leg you know like the lotus position like uh, kung fu hui but um you do cleanse your mind and you think of things you never even think you'd think about new ideas things that's happened in the past come to terms with some of the bad stuff you've done come to terms with some of the good stuff you've done it's uh, it's quite eye opening. This is this is this is what uh, relates to also what you mentioned earlier about the way that the the generation, well, my kids. So my kids are yeah. what ten or thirteen in a minute. The, the way they're growing up um, in the, the, exactly what we talk about there. The, I mean, I grew up uh, on a farm on my own, uh, not my own. Fucking on my own. What are you talking about I have a parents. Obviously, my daughter, my my sister. Could have been my daughter as well. No, my <laughs> my, uh, my sister, um, who was a few years younger than me, we didn't really get on. So I had a lot of time. Uh, I'm a, I, I can be a deep thinker when I want to be, and I can yeah. come from when I grew up. A lot of thinking time, a lot of out, outdoors, cutting about. There was no computers, mate. Yeah, there was no yeah. phones, and I don't. I, I think that uh, I really, I genuinely think that uh, because the onset of the technology we got now, and I'm talking in the home. You know, phones, uh, iPads, all that, you know, flipping blue screen stuff, right? Yeah. I do think that the onset of that has been so rapid, okay? And that, and that, the, that my kids, for example, mm-hmm. are growing up with such... A, it, their 
their experience of childhood is night and day difference to what mine was and your was. It is, yep. and that's in the space of a generation, Brian. Yep. It is, yep. I do think, it, catastrophic may not be the right word, I do think that in 25, 30 years' time, maybe longer, maybe slightly less, when they're <laughs> adults and all the differences in them and the health differences in them, mm-hmm. positive or negative, positive or negative, yep. I do believe that most it's yep. going to be negative, from things like eyesight to cognitive ability to, to the way they react to people, it's going to be so huge. It's going to be, it'll almost be like, um, you know, when you have a massive, a massive uh, increase in like suicides after a big conflict, you know, it's going to be, and people go, fucking hell, oh my God, it's going to be that quick. I don't well, think people are going to realise. This technology thing, due to these algorithms... It just accelerating too fast. We can't keep pace with it. Simple as that. Well, no, I, we can't evolve quick enough. I, I, evolution no. takes millions and millions and millions of years. All but, of a sudden, but it, you know, here, a lot of the stuff I hear on the television, problems with this, problems with obesity, problems with that. It all boils down to the parents. Simple as that. Mm-hmm. You know, if you've got fat parents, you'll have fat kids. So, probably, you know. A good parent, and I meet lots of good parents because you usually find them on the beach in remote places. Their kids, for some reason, all look fit. The people are nice to speak to. They've got the balance there. They go down. If my daughter wants some money off me, I'll just say, yep, what do you want? Uh, 20 quid. Go down and sit in the care for an hour. Leave your phone here. Oh, my God. <laughs> Dear. Yeah. Brilliant. I say, okay, well, well take, I agree with you. I take agree your with phone it. with you, but take it in the care because there's no internet connection. Oh, God. Falling to bits here, trauma. Oh, God. Quicker, a couple of satellites are hit by debris in the atmosphere, and we go through a little period of no comms. That'll be good. Yeah, yeah, no. I'm looking forward to that. Yeah, I agree, mate. I I got a a cousin who. um, And I know what your favourite film is. What? Interstellar. How do you know that? Because I know it. How do you know that? (laughs) Probably my favourite sci fi. Yeah, Yeah. because Murph looks a bit like your daughter. Oh, yeah, a little bit, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah a little bit, yeah. It's my favourite. Do you cry at the end as well? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I love it. I love Fucking brilliant film, mate. Fucking brilliant film. Uh, anyway, uh, I mean, I've got a cousin, right, who um, he, so what, you we're talking early 2000s, yeah, 2003, and World of Warcraft, the game, oh, the online yeah. game, had, not, had been around for a little bit then. Not, not for, um, yeah, 2003, I reckon. Anyway. He, long story short, he, he, he was immersed in this game. People may be aware of World of Warcraft, fucking hugely immersed in the game. Very, very, very addictive. People have died from uh, malnutrition planet. Kids have died from malnutrition yeah. planet, right? Um, he ended up having to go to a psychologist um, to get to have therapy, mm. right? Because of the impacts of the game. And one of the things was basically it's all, it was all to do with screen time. Right? It's not yeah, that the game yeah. was crazy, like violent or anything. It's a fucking wizards and shit, you know, yeah. potions and that. Um, but it's to do with screen time, you know, in nonstop in front of the screen, right? And one of the problems he had <laughs> was um, one of the like, sorry, one of the symptoms he had was in conversation. If if you were him mm-hmm. and I was me, okay, you're you're my cousin, and you asked me a question, right? Like, what time is it? Yeah. If I didn't reply instantly, he would fly off the handle. <laughs> I never experienced it. I remember, I remember his sister telling me about that. Was funny. He would fly off the handle. Because what happens when you click the button on the mouse? Yep. Instant, instant response. What happens when you press the button on the keyboard? Instant response. What happens when you tap your finger on the screen of an iPad? Instant response. Okay, and this, we're talking in thousands now. So it's one of those, I, I've got mm-hmm. past experience indirectly with it. So you've got all, all these kids going back to it. It just, it, it, it we're in for a fucking shock. Oh, Absolute have they upgraded shock. the and Amstrad 64 now, then? <laughs> yeah, the, Amst- I've yeah, still got Greenberry on that. <laughs> <laughs> I remember that game. That was, <laughs> that was fucking brilliant. Yeah. That was brilliant. And what was the other one? Spectrum ZX. Spectrum ZX? Spectrum ZX? Well, oh, that was a posh one, one that. Uh, so, what were you like before, before you joined that then? What were you, what were you like as a kid? Uh, pretty much a violent father, living in a very poor mining house, colliery wise. But. Uh, Privileged to have come up through that because sometimes we'd stay with me nana, sometimes we'd stay with me auntie, sometimes just six in a bed, no central heating. I was the youngest, so I was in the, the tub in front of the fire last. I got dipped in the soup, <laughs> head on the, um, the newspaper to get the nits out and back to bed. But um, 
luckily enough, I had a good headmaster at junior school, and he got me into grammar school. What school did you go to? Peatley Grammar Technical School. Ah, so you, you've been in these parts all your life then? Oh, yeah, yeah, ah, yeah, okay. until I joined the military and, uh, and went away. What, would you, what age did you join up? 19, because uh, I got told I couldn't join earlier because of a criminal record. But my local recruiting sergeant, a uh, good man he was, uh, when he came back off leave, he got me straight in. That was uh, a good move, good move. Yeah. Couldn't get on the police because I had visible tattoos. <laughs> mm. You can't be a policeman now without tattoos, can uh, you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, what, but what, what, so what you, personality-wise? Uh, I was a bit of a thug. I was always fighting, playing football, basketball. I was a very good sportsman. Uh, but we were all like that then. Mm. All us kids, it was just about going out, playing footy till it got dark, going down the woods, having a laugh, having a fight with the next street, and there was no malice or nastiness involved. There's no people getting knifed or anything. Mm. They were just fisty cuffs. And, but it was like the, the collieries then. Uh, self-disciplined. You were scared of policemen. Because if a policeman got all of you and took you back, yeah. you'd get off your father again. Yeah, yeah. Uh, after and that the, was after called, the policeman. Yeah. <laughs> and that was called, in my personal opinion, healthy respect. They're just having a laugh now. You can see it on the streets. They're going to just turn the piss out of the place. Mm. And it'll be stay that way until something changes, which it won't. It won't. It can't change. No. It can't change. No. It's, it's a whole problem with, the, again, the, 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 the sort of the snowflake. Not the snow. Not the snow. The, why this, you know, that, this whole snowflake thing's come about... Um, the political political correctness. Uh, you can't mollycoddle everyone. You can't do it. If you try, if you take away all the ba- all the bad influences on 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 people, which you can't do anyway. Well, there's no learning experiences. Mm. If everything's positive, no one gr- you don't grow as a human being. You don't grow as a society. Yeah. You don't grow as a culture. Yeah. I, I think you gotta have it. You gotta have hardships. Um, it's uh, it's one of. The, I mean, uh, we, conflict is in our nature. Yeah, it's in our nature. It yeah, you can't never going to stop war unless you. Well, you're never going to stop it. Never. It's like let's you know you can hypothesize. Well, let's get rid of well, tribalism is a problem. Let's get rid of all the countries. Let's have a uh, un, um, universal big, basic income for everyone. Let's let's say we we hypothetically are able to everyone can have the same amount of food. You, basically, everyone's got all the same shit. Yeah, someone will find a fucking reason to get pissed off and go on and get angry at someone else of because. Course. Because yeah. um, my country's hotter than your country. It's nice to live in yours. or Well, not country, my area. And all of a sudden, this all goes through all again. We didn't start off with countries. Yeah. You know, we were like you're saying, we're all, well, maybe not. We're all a bunch of races. Some of us from... Uh... <laughs> I, mean, I mean, Kennedy was slotted by Lyndon B. Johnson with J. Edgar Hoover. So they start the Vietnamese War. <coughs> so they'd sell lots of munitions. To start it. Yeah, Lyndon B. Johnson. But if you read that war, I mean, that was disgusting. They were a very, very nice race of people. And you cannot defeat a people that have nothing to lose. Mm. And they, you know, they all portrayed them as the evil little sort of um, slant-eyed Vietnamese who are very peaceful people, mm-hmm. uh, subjugated to the point of uh, nothing left to lose. That's, that's a, that, that, side of the, that side of the world is fascinating to me. That, uh, that I was going to say race, that, the, that part of the human race. Yeah. Those, you know, Japan... Vietnam, Cambodia, so, sort of well, Far East Asia, you know? They, they, uh, did you know that Japan, by 2022, I think it is, over 40% of their population will be elderly? They're the oldest mm. population in the world. How are they? How? What are they, how, what are they doing that we're not? Fish food, a pint, yeah. a pint of water first thing in the morning. Yeah, That's respecting standard. their elders, cutting about, really active. Well, I hope they go to hunting rat- whales. I hope they go to ratchet because they're going to start killing whales again for no reason at all. Yeah, well, what is what is? I don't know much about it. Tell me, about it. I saw it in the news. They've decided there. to go uh, pull out of the international whaling ban. What, what's the benefit to them for the whales? Of, Nothing. Whales? They like the taste. The mink whales are usually go to catch. They got, so they've got their twelve mile of their water, and two hundred miles beyond that, where they're just going to start slaughtering them again for food. The last bullshit was scientific research. <coughs> this one is. We don't agree if they're going to start hunting whales again. There must be quite a big, big, some big need there, though, not just taste yeah. for them to do that. You don't think so? <coughs> Tell me why you can't wrap the kids something that's in a whale. <coughs> Pardon me. Right. I don't know, can you? No, it's a taste. They, 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 they were quite open about it. You know? Mm, surprising, isn't it? 
It did surprise me because I, 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 I'm very fond of the, the, the discipline and the, the, the Japanese race itself, how they conduct themselves uh, and the discipline involved mm. that they have. Yeah. I've been there. Have you been out there yet? I have been there. I've not yeah. been. I'm, I want to go. I've never yeah. been. It wasn't a nice place called Osaka. Uh, I've heard of Osaka. Very industrial. And uh, we, it was the 6th of August and uh, nobody let us in the taxis. And I found out later it was because it was the anniversary of Hiroshima and they thought we were Americans. Oh, fucking <laughs> hell. Oh, mate. Yeah. Yeah. Um... So on a serious note, what yeah. what do you uh, what do you want? How much thought have you given to when you retire? What are you going to do? Uh, bit at a time. I'm, I'm, we're only running a course once every month, uh, once every two months this year, so I can gradually wind down, if we can call it that. Yeah. And then uh, Nick, who's coming on, he'll be taking over. And we've got who, who, who's coming? On? Nick, Nick um, McCarthy. Oh yeah, yeah, sorry, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, and I'll probably still be popping back, but I don't want to be in there every day doing the admin, doing the admin all the time. Away on holiday, checking my emails every day. It might go wrong, it might not go wrong. I don't know, but that's what I'm going to do. I've got places I want to see mm-hmm. all around the northwest of this beautiful British Isles. Are you planning to go overseas at all? No, I don't want to go overseas again. Really? Can't take my dogs, I ain't going anywhere. Uh, would you sail? I've sailed, yeah. I've got skipper's tickets in uh, Powerland Yacht. Mm. But I couldn't get the dogs on. Obviously, they need the, um, the stretch. They need what? They need a stretch and they need a poo. Oh, right. So if I was sailing uh, around the UK, yeah, yeah, which yeah, was yeah, one yeah. of my ideas, yeah. it wouldn't suit them. They'd probably be dog sick or something as well. Yeah. Yeah. But retirement, we'll see. There's a few charities I might want to get involved with, especially to do with animals, um, which is my favourite. Topic. Have you, still got, have you still got the parrot? No, uh, she told me to fuck off. She, literally? No. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, she was losing feathers. And when they're losing feathers, the boar, despite the fact she had the whole run of the house. My friend has a place called Tweddle Farm, very near me. They had another three parrots there. So I gave it her to him. Yeah. Sure, she's in it. She's in it. Oh, that's good. Um, Do you see her? Other parrots. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I pop down now and again, but I don't want to. Just in case, because they were apparently the second most intelligent animal on the planet. Remember you saying, Who's the, what's the first? <laughs> uh, yeah. It was not from Sun. Oh, sorry. <laughs> um, so she's integrated in with the, with the other parrots down there, and yeah. she stimulated it, although I didn't want to say I fought the bits for um, a cosmetic reason of mine. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah. she learned Toon Army very quickly. It's good, good of her. She learned what? The Toon Army. Toon, Toon. Oh, Toon Army. Army Toon. You know? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, mate. Um, what happened to the? Um, oh no, never mind that question. I know what happened. Uh, what else were we going to talk about? There's something else we're going to bring up. I think we did it. Mm. We did. We did Brexit. Yeah. We did women on the front line. Yep. Uh, did you? Uh, in fact, going back to that, because I, I I I work with women on the front line in different capacities. Capacities. It really had an issue. Apart, well, it was there was a couple of times where. Fitness was an issue, and they slowed yeah. the patrol down, come back in, crossing up and ground, things like that. But that was down to their fitness levels were lower than... Yeah. The standards they had to be at were lower than what the inventory mm. was. But you shouldn't really fucking put the inventory there, mate. Um, did you, during your time, did you have a... Do you do a lot of work with, with women or not? Uh, when I spent a bit of time in Northern Ireland, yeah. uh, they ran a selection process for women to work undercover. Uh and we had some uh, two girls with us who were very, very good. But at the end of the day, they weren't going to be tramping over the hills or anything, doing no peas. They were going to be doing um, surveillance against terrorists in the vehicles. Mm-hmm. And obviously, a man and a woman looks a lot more natural than a man by himself. Um, so, yes, and they were very competent pistol-wise as well, mm-hmm. uh, weapons-wise. So I had nothing but admiration for called Jane and Rusty, the first two that came through. Great two kids who were and very capable and very competent. Mm. Is that the only time? Mm? Is that the only time? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I've worked when I was flying commercially with female uh, captains, female pilots. Very capable. Oh, well, yeah, fucking hell. I mean, that's, that is what I was going to talk about. 
Yeah. There's a lot of there's like there's myths around you. Oh, yeah. <laughs> the, le- the leg end. <laughs> well, no, the commercial pilot one. Obviously, that's true. Yeah. So you got so you got out, right? You did you did Kilroy. <laughs> I got out. Then what did you do? I got out. I was a manager of a refrigeration factory, debt collecting in Toxteth and Liverpool. It was great. Debt collecting. Yeah. yeah. And then I went into cross <laughs> protection uh, with Sheikh Yamani, Saudi oil minister. Mm-hmm. Very. Uh, the plum job on the circuit at the time. Uh, my wife died while I was working for him. Uh, knocked me back a bit, obviously. Mm. Uh, and then when the time was right, I left his... Because um, I got married again, I didn't want to be away. I left there and uh, joined North Yorkshire Fire Brigade. I was in that for two years at York. And then my father-in-law, who had a jet, said, if you pass your commercial... Pilot's license, you can fly the jet. So I spent 15 months at Oxford getting my commercial oblique IR tickets to fly his jet 55,000 quid later. Fucking hell. And he sold it about a month before I finished the course. <laughs> so I used to fly the heart team around Europe, picking bits of hearts and lungs and bits of stuff up. Really? That was a buzz. Yeah, was what a was buzz. the fire brigade like? Yeah, I was disappointed. Uh, why is that? Um, because the standards I thought would be higher. I didn't. You could go in there and have two pints of beer while you're on duty, which there's no way in the world I was going to drink while I was a firefighter. That's old school. And I used to lie on top of my bunk, fully clothed, ready for the um, the shout to come. And I'd be in that fire engine, uh, fully clothed, waiting for at least a minute and a half till people got out of bed in the underpants, got the clothes on. Mm. And we had a particular <coughs> incident... Well, we got the shout on our tier. We're driving down the road. We've seen a car about half a mile ahead. We just sort of saw it go into flick of flames. Got there and the lad was dead. And then we, we came back. Everybody was getting ready for bed. I said, we're not having a debrief. About what? And then I just lost my temper a little bit, which I never do. About if you'd been on that fucking appliance the same time as me, that kid would be alive. And you wouldn't be so fucking blase if it was a little kitty in a burning house, would you? Mm. So I decided to leave there and then. Hmm. That's that's a fair one. I I, mm, I wonder what, if it's changed at all. Don't know. So uh, so yeah, moving swiftly on then. Um, you flying the heart team round? Who, yeah. Who, so was that what NHS? Was NHS? Was there NHS back then? No, they used to hire private airplanes for this little firm I was working for from Teesside. Um, we'd say get get a call. Can you pick the t- the heart team up from the Freeman at Newcastle yeah. and fly to such and such? Like a do- it's like a transplant thing. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, so they'd go over, you know, they go over and either take the organs from the body and bring yeah. them back because the Freeman is new custody with the major heart surgery uh, in the country. And uh, bring them back in, obviously, casks and refrigerated uh, and then do the, the transplant. So, and then sometimes I'd fly oil riggers to Norway. It was, it was varied little bits. It's for a private firm? Yeah, yeah. What, what was the training like? What, how long was the training to be a commercial pilot? In? It, it was 13 months, extremely intense, six days a week. Very hard course. And you can fail it, I take it? Oh, yeah. yeah. So, uh, apart from obvious like physical limitations, like, like shit eyesight and, yeah. uh, and stuff, what, on the mental side, what, how do they test you? Well, there's about 19 different exams to do with aeronautics, climatology, all sorts of stuff, and the practical flying bit. And if you fly by instruments where you've got a mask on <laughs> and you only see is three little panels, it's called limited panel flying then uh, you really are tested with the limit, discipline-wise. So they, 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 they block out the view of all the other panels? What, what are the three? Yeah, so like? Altitude, cloud, take it. Yeah. Altitude, what else do you have? Direction? Yeah, and... you've got your artificial horizon indicator. Yeah. You've got your slip and turn coordinator. What's that? Oh, the way, the, the orientation the of the plane? The wings are level or not level. Yeah. And then you've got your altimeter. And what, what have you got to do when you're on that? Just You've got to land? Combination. You, you come down to about 200 feet, which is what's called minimus. If you can't see your runway by about 200 feet, it's different at different runways, then you've got to go around again. So they would lift the mask up at 200 feet and all of a sudden there's a runway just about oh to God. land. <laughs> 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 but because of my previous training, I don't panic. Yeah. And you've got to not panic. Yeah. Because they say aviate, communicate. Sorry, aviate, navigate, communicate. Yeah. And that's the basics of fly it. See where you're at then. Then talk about it. Yeah, yeah. Don't do any other combination. You'll go in. Yeah. How long did you do that for? The flying? Uh, 
a year and a half, and I got bored. <laughs> I still flew private. I used to fly private shares in three little aircraft. When, when did you finish flying? Uh, 94, I think. Oh, really? Yeah. What did you do after that, then? Uh, after you set after my own you... business up. Oh, that, this is... Um, Argus Investigations, and then developed uh, into Argus Europe. So it's Argus Investigations to start with, then? Yeah. Right, okay, I didn't realise it. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah 94, yeah. I, yeah, I remember that from the brief. Yeah, fucking hell. Were you just a one-man band, then? Yeah. And um, it was... A couple of friends who were lawyers, and that's how I started the trail off. Bam, bam, bam. Oh, so they, they, you get the business through them? Yeah. Well, yeah. I end up having nine, nine guys working for about five years, three teams out every day, just doing surveillance, mainly med- medical litigation. Yeah. And it's good for the brain. So, um, yeah, absolutely. Well, it's not a fucking easy job. It's not an easy no. job, mate, is it? No. I, I, it's one of the things when I did, when I did the course, and, uh, I was lucky enough to land a job uh, at the circuit, um, but surveillance always sort of appealed to me when, when, when I when I sort of into that world not that world of security surveillance after done the course yeah but I quickly realised well one I didn't have the cash to put the outline of the kit anyway but I quickly realised this is not fucking easy no <laughs> it's one of the t- gotta be one of the toughest jobs one of yeah. the toughest jobs out there I don't think people realise it's flipping hardcore one of the toughest jobs to do professionally yeah. I, I think you know um, uh, patience. Patience is the big Patience, one. Patience, mental discipline. Yeah. Uh, you've got to be thinking quick. You've got to be thinking what happens if you've got to be thinking way ahead of the game. Yeah. Which is what I like, so stimulating. Yeah. Uh, and stimulating when we used to do it over the water was getting the end result, which is slightly different to the end result these, yeah, <laughs> what we yeah, do yeah, over here. Yeah. So it's a lot of the stuff, so a lot of the course, that's obviously a, the, the, this is the, what's the word? The structure of it, the curriculum, if you like. That's obviously in line with, um, Module wise, in line with what's required by the SIA, SIA. but technique wise, is a lot of that f- from your own experience when you were yes. doing that stuff. Yeah, because uh, that was some, uh, you didn't get to take chances out there, you know. How was it developed back then? The the, the, the techniques because it was relatively new, right? Relatively yeah, new. Just guys on the ground making mistakes and formulating and thinking, all, all pretty, you know, without blowing smoke up our own bombs. Are you? We're all pretty fast thinking guys. Mm. I could think through, you know, all, it was all cross uh, military, you know, Paris Marines, all, all sorts of the army, and we'd all put our heads around problems, mm. and we'd solve the problems. And a lot of the technology today came from them problems we solved, secure comms, trackers, all that type of stuff. Yeah, uh, we were at the front edge of, that, of all that, and it was a very stimulating time. Yeah, because at that time we had the backing of the government. Not the case now. Nope. Oh really? They'll mm. sell you salt the devil, man, wouldn't they? Mm. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah, so, yeah, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah I see what you're saying. I think there's an interesting fact where nearly all them top European leaders have no children. So really? Yeah, check, check that fact out. How many of the top European leaders have children? Is that not down to a, um, is that down to just a, a, a personal choice, career, want to excel, it and the best? It may maybe. well be, it may well be, but I would sort of suggest, well, who are they thinking ahead for for the future? Ah. I see. That was my point on it. I see, yeah. 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 Macron hasn't. Yeah. May hasn't. Merkel hasn't. I think it's about another three or four of them. Yeah, it's a good point, actually. Mm. I, yeah, I didn't realise that. It's a good point. Yeah. Uh, I, was, I was listening to um, the news earlier about the, the, uh, the new Brazilian Prime Minister. Oh, yeah, the right winger. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Fucking madman, madman! Uh, the the uh, I de- he declared himself as a proud homophobe. <laughs> <laughs> he said if he said if uh, I'm la- it's not la- like I'm laughing because the audacity of it in this day and age, you know, he sort of places like that. And what did he say? He said if I saw two men kissing in the street, I'd go over and I uh, I I I'd, I'd physically assault them or something. <laughs> Words to that effect. Ah, oh, like, just like oh, hearing yeah. the feminists and the um, the LGBTs arguing. Oh, I just, I love that. The feminists just said, look, <clears throat> you've got a dick. You're a bloke. End of story. I don't care what you think you're thinking about. <laughs> That's it, as simple as that, physiology-wise. And uh, it just makes me laugh. What do you think about um, the idea that gender is a social construct? Well, uh, you know, males and females are equal in all sorts of different work, different jobs, different thoughts, as bright as us, as good as us. But there's certain tasks that they can't fulfil. Mm-hmm. It's gone a bit too far now. Of got to have everything, everything and more, everything and more. 
I think it's gone. I think it's gone. It's gone. I think it's it's going to come. It, it's gone that far. It's just ridiculous now. I think it'll it'll, it'll reset itself yeah, because it can't go anywhere. There's no. nowhere for it to go. It's so it's because it's an impossible thing they're trying to they're trying to fit, they're trying to trying to implement. No like, yeah. equality across the board. Okay, so and I'm all for women getting equal. Sh- uh, no, I'm all for women not being discriminated against. Yeah, right? of course. Just for being a woman. All right. However, I'm all for well if the job says you got to like carry 55 pound across 60 miles or whatever then and you can't do that then no oh you happen to be a woman well you didn't pass the fucking test right but um uh, where the fuck was I going with that then it, uh, makes, it makes you feel like I'm a white male here I should be I might as well not exist here yeah yeah you mate it's, I mean it's that you I mean, don't have you watched have you watched the new Doctor Who I am I'm no. not <laughs> <laughs> you don't hear about um, a, a, an uproar because that uh, because men are over represented over represented in construction for example you don't you, no. you, you don't do yeah. yeah. well hang yeah. on a minute well let's get 50-50 why not because it's fucking labour intensive it's very physical and it's majority suited to men because in general we are more physically capable. In general. Yes, there are some women out there who will kick my fucking ass, right? You know, there's some women out there who is, who is great fighters of some of their, you know, MMA mm. male fighters, for example. But at the same time, you don't hear men kicking off that are women over, over-represented, over-represented in childcare. Because women are fucking better at it. Yeah. Because we ain't the same. Because it's in women's inherent nature... They they are the babies. They're the mothers. You know, it's yeah. it's just one. It, it it's gone. Chur- it, Churchill, it went to a level. Was like I understand. That's good. Churchill, now it's gone for yeah, men. Churchill quoted, "The best investment in this country is mother's milk." Now, if anybody can tell me a better occupation for a mother to bring a child up in a house and educate her myself, I don't think there's a, an argument against that. Mm-hmm. You no, know? No, 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 I agree. I agree. That's that's the way it is, in well, my opinion. One of the uh, one of the arguments, uh, one of the, sorry, one of the discussion points we say as well with that is that uh, is um, that you have you have you, know, you have a, a husband and wife, and they both want to succeed, but the the woman is expected to look after the child, be at home, and and so her career is limited, and she can you know and uh, her career you know. Yeah, career potential is limited, blah, 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 blah. And that's blamed on sort of the culture, but I, I, the male-female culture and, and the men we expect to go and do things. But I, I was thinking about it, and in this day and age, that's the, I think that's down to the individual. It, that's down to the relationship between the husband and wife. It should be a, the wife should be, look, I want a career too. We need to fucking iron this out. So we're doing 50-50 on the child, by the way. Yeah. Not, you know, the, the excuse that it's the man's fault, she feels depressed, but she's never been told you're staying at home. You pipe up, pipe up. And go out and say, I'm not happy with this. Can we have a discussion, please? You know, it's, it's, that, yeah. it's, a, it's a, the baseline level. It's not always a blame for everything. It's fine to realise the blame's on yourself sometimes. The blame's on yourself sometimes. You know, you have this attitude. It's, everyone else, it's a classic. <laughs> everyone else snowflake, LGBT sometimes. Everyone else to blame. Not yeah. as. Sometimes yeah. you just got to do it yourself. I would love to have brought my kids up if my partner would go out and work. I would have loved, loved it. Mm. But that wasn't the situation. Mm-hmm. Similar as. Mm-hmm. 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 Right, let's start wrapping it up. Uh, anything you want to mention? Uh, no, it's been an absolute privilege. Uh, I don't get the chance to speak um, as open as this about different topics where I can get a, um, I regard um, a good, intelligent, professional response. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, I, I, I didn't, mate. I honestly flipping, nearly fell off my chair when, uh, when, when you said yes. Coming on, uh, partly because your background, I you know, and and uh, uh I'm really happy because you're probably the most intelligent person I know. I respect you a lot, yeah. you know, um, and you're a friend, you're a friend, so uh, thank you for coming I on. I mean, mate. I'm at the edge now where I'm gonna be, I'm doing things now I've never done before. I'm even bringing my veterans' discount card out and saying, Excuse me, do you discount for veterans? <laughs> I would never have been, I would have been embarrassed to do that before, and I'm telling. Th- Things I haven't told, I'm still very closely guarded and things that's still going to be happening, potentially. Mm. Uh, but I think it's about time people started speaking up about various topics that's very important, especially if you've been in the military, about how our military, ex-military are being threat. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think it's disgraceful. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, I, I mean, there's enough people kicking up a fuss about it. I hope it'll change. Yeah. I had Johnny Mercer on, the M- MP, who was an ex... Uh... X29 Commando. Oh, yes. Yeah. yeah I like uh, him. F- what a fucking good yeah. guy. Is he mate. pool MP or something somewhere down there? 
He's Pooh. Uh, Plymouth. 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 Yeah. What a yeah. good guy, right? And, yeah. and uh, I think so. I mean, I'm very skeptical of politicians anyway. Of course. Uh, it's it's yeah. just it's by design. It is a it is a, a system b- to succeed. You have to bullshit. You do. That's just what it mm-hmm. is, right? But I can. I, but at the same time, I firmly believe that people go into it with honest intentions and keep those honest intentions. But as part of that, you have to be dishonest, right? I'm yeah. not saying. I'm not. Yeah. Hey, I'm not saying Johnny's fucking dishonest. Yeah. yeah. But I mean, he was a cl- He came on. He feels very strongly about it. He didn't. What he did not do beforehand, or I did not get from his office is what questions are you going to ask? And you can't talk about this, isn't this? Nothing. Came on like you and I are doing. Which, yeah. which first off, I thought, that's it, tick in the box. Good guy. I mean, I'm not Labour or Conservative, I'm fucking, I'm yeah, nothing. Right? I'm not. But um, I, I think enough of our fuss has been kicked up huh? that is the forward progress we made, but it's just taking fucking ages, mate. It's well, the only man with it. honest intention ever to go in the house upon, as we know, is Guy Fox. <laughs> <laughs> right, Argus Europe. Uh, ArgusEurope.co.uk, correct? Yep. You're on all the social media. Uh, say the services you do for Ar- Argus, mate. You do uh, so. You do surveillance. You provide security. You provide surveillance. Yep, we do the medical, private investigation, advanced surveillance, and the close protection level three. They're the courses. Yeah, all in one package of nineteen days. Uh, but then, on, uh, as well as that, yeah, the services the company provide corporate services, commercial services. Yes, we services. do. Yeah, private close investigation, private investigation, close uh, protection, which is surveillance. Security. Yeah, do you do pen testing? Um, we're going to be starting it very, very shortly. Okay. Because we've got a very, as you know, a very intricate network of people. And we can call on lots of people that have different skills all around the world. That's come through the course. We still keep in touch with each other very closely. And it's a very, very good network of passing int, mm. as well as giving people work. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It, is, it is, yeah. It is. Mate, I, I, I can't say that. I always... Yeah. It's, one of those, uh, it's one of those things with, um, the, with close protection surveillance training. You get the forums online and people will go on... And everyone is naturally going to say, yeah, the person I trained, the company I trained was yeah. fucking amazing. And I'm fully aware of that. And so I always pipe up, ah, because you're, you know, fucking brilliant. Yeah. And I do think that. But um, one of the things with Argus is, from a training perspective, is that I've not seen or heard anyone else mention about other schools in the way it is with Argus, is the after-course support. I mean, yeah. um, uh, in that, oh, you, that network you're talking about, yeah. just muckers, muckers, and the attitude you have. You know, even other other guys that have got have done your course, gone and done, been successful in surveillance, close protection, and they set up their own companies. And yeah. you guys got that attitude where you and Nick, that attitude where well, help each other out, all at one of purpose. Course. You know, yeah. it's, it's it's very refreshing. That, everybody that, everybody that. gets on. We yeah. help people. Uh, there's a thing called greed, isn't there? <laughs> Difference between uh, want and need is greed. We're not. We help people out, and that's a feel good factor mm. as well. Mm. Could have made more money out of it, but what's the point, mm. you know? Mm-hmm. But uh, we like everybody again. It comes back round in circles, yeah, you know. Exactly. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Um, right. Well, hopefully I'll see you again later this year. Uh, but if, if you're I down don't... the cave later on here, well, uh, I'll have the fire on. <laughs> well, yeah. <laughs> I think we're going to point with Nick, <laughs> mate. Good luck with your time. I appreciate yeah, it. Cheers, much mate. as much as grassy, mate. Cheers.